on the phone. We're going to get started any second now. Okay, I'd like to call this continued meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Mr. Peterson. Present. Ms. LaFrance. Here. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Here. Sorry. Mr. Rivera. Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Here. Mr. Constant. Here. Ms. Kennedy. Here. Mr. Perez Verdia. Here. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Ms. Zalatel. Here. Ms. Hollard. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Dunbar, can you please lead us in the pledge? Thank you. Ms. LaFrance, if you could lead us in the land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It is a public gesture of appreciation for the past <laughs> indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It is a national statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratefulness and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you. <clears throat> so if you uh, want to go over a few things before we roll back into public testimony for 13B. Um, so we're going to start with public testimony for 13B. Uh, finish up the list and then go back and uh, try a second time for the few people that we couldn't get to. Then after 13B, uh, we have a motion from Mr. Dunbar regarding item 13A, which we will entertain at that time. Then as a reminder for folks who were uh, following us yesterday, uh, two items which I discussed yesterday, item 13I and item 14 D, um, as sometimes happens, uh, the sponsor for item 13I has changed uh, tactics. Um, 13I, rather than postponing this item uh, to the, uh, a future meeting, it will be postponed indefinitely. At least that is the intent of the sponsor. Then regarding item 14D, uh, it is, again, the intent of the sponsors to postpone or continue the public hearing on this item to the meeting of September uh, 25th, or excuse me, September 15th, um, because there was a little bit of uh, question and curiosity around this. So if folks who testify today on item 14D, um, they will only be able to testify again on the 20, sorry, on the 15th, if there is an S version. Otherwise, this would be your only chance to testify on item 14D. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and go through public testimony for item 13B, AO 2020-65. We'll go ahead and start with Dean Cannon. Hello? 
Hi, Mr. Cannon. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Felix, and uh, Assembly members here of consideration. On youth suicide, there's undeniably a mental health crisis affecting our youth. Kids are exposed to graphic pornography and violence. They're sexualized in the media. 50% of their parents divorce. When children present with distress, they're usually prescribed psychotropic drugs. There's uh, an existential vacuum in their lives. Ordinance 202065 uh, is not about conversion therapy that I see it. 89% of all children who profess the same sex attraction reported one year later that preference had changed. Kids go through phases. This ordinance would politicize those phases. The entire ordinance rests on two pillars. One is an online survey linking conversion therapy with suicide attempts. I've uh, repeatedly asked the assembly for the source data for this survey, but they've not provided it. As a survivor of youth therapy, I can tell you, sitting in a therapist's chair, regardless of the reason you're there, is a depressing childhood experience. I doubt conversion therapy alone is the only kind of therapy that leads to suicidal ideation. The linchpin of the ordinance is a document called Ending Conversion Therapy, Supporting and Affirming LGBTQ Youth, prepared by Democratic Lobby Group, ABT Associates. The document mentions the word suicide only 12 times. However, it uses the terms gender minority children or youth 121 times. The word minority was used a staggering 183 times. The report demonizes religious people, parents, conservative people. It's heterophobic. It says aspects of sexuality are displayed in infancy. I urge all to read it. The report is obsessed with group identity, victims, and oppressors. The people behind the ordinance have good intentions, but the movement won't stop until it's divided everybody into such groups of oppressors and victims. Assembly members, I have a gay brother, I have gay associates. Let me tell you about my cousin Glenn. His dad was killed in a car accident when Glenn was three. My aunt says this changed him profoundly. All he could remember of his father was a blue and white jacket. Glenn came out to us in early adulthood. We were supportive. We made it clear we did not care who we loved, but that we loved him. In the last years of his life, Glenn became a bartender. He was a handsome guy. The job gave him confidence as well as new frustration. He started getting attention from girls and asked a lot of questions about them. He wanted nothing more than to be a father since he was a kid. But he struggled with enormous pressure from his peer group not to convert or be a traitor. In 2011, Glenn committed suicide, my cousin. The last year of his life was gut-wrenching. He died disoriented and confused, not wanting to disappoint anybody. This ordinance would enshrine the peer pressures that played a role in Glenn's and other suicides. Absolutely no speech should be criminalized or off the table between parent, patient, and caregiver. I urge you not to use political activism to drive a wedge between parents and their children. It won't achieve what you think it will. Children do not remain children forever. They learn to question life. They may forgive their parents for not being perfect, but as adults, they'll never forgive those who sought to use and manipulate them while claiming to protect them. And that is my testimony. I thank you all for the opportunity. And uh, please vote no on this resolution without at least more data, more background, and thank you. Um, uh, more humanity. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Quentin Andrew Lange. Hi, Mr. Lange. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm in a truck if it's a little loud. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I just want to... Um, I don't have anything written in front of me, unfortunately. You just caught me at work, but... Um, I feel like this, uh, uh, what we're talking about is unfortunately kind of unconstitutional as far as trying to, um, trying to limit what parents can do for their children as far as this topic is concerned. Um, I just want the people that are pushing for it to really step back and look and see if, if this is kind of a socialistic or almost communistic mindset based on trying to limit 
um, people in, in their own lives and their own children, trying to limit what they can do uh, for what's best for their children. And, um, yeah, just, just really look at it hard and just, just see if that's what's really what's best for the kids. Um, unfortunately, you caught me at a bad time. I don't have anything written in front of me, but that's all I want to share. Thank you for uh, the time uh, to share it. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Next, we have Kevin Thomas. Hi, Mr. Thomas. This is Felix Rivera. You here with the Anchorage Assembly? We are on public yes, testimony for AO twenty twenty sixty five. You have three minutes. Welcome. Oh, okay. Um, am I ready? Am I supposed to come up right away here, or immediately? Uh, you can. You can start. Um, you can go ahead. The floor is yours. The floor is mine. Okay. Um, I, I guess uh, my, my first point is that uh, all the members of the assembly have uh, sworn an oath of office uh, um, uh, that they'll, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not quite prepared yet, it was a little bit of a short notice, but uh, uh, that they will support and defend the Constitution of the United States as a, as a municipal officer and uh, the Constitution, the First Amendment of the Constitution, uh, says that Congress shall make no law uh, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and uh, the Assembly is below Congress, therefore they have, they're held to the same standard, and this, uh, <clears throat> this ordinance uh, uh, 2020 AO65 uh, is infringing upon uh, the rights of uh, uh, people to ex freely express their religion and their their rights of speech. Therefore, it's uh, an unconstitutional ordinance, and the assembly shouldn't even be uh, wasting people's time with such things. Uh, they should they should know the constitution and and defend that as they uh, as they stated in their oath of office. And I think that's the the conclusion of they have more important and uh, better things to do with their time, and they shouldn't be trying to promote ordinances that are unconstitutional. Is, does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you for your testimony, sir. I don't see any questions. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Next, we have Whitney Wiegren. Hello. Hi, uh, Ms. Wiegren. This is Felix. Yeah. Uh, you're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony on AO 2020-65. Uh, yes. Yeah, you have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Let me uh, just grab my uh, little sheet quickly. Uh, it's much different now that it is um, virtual, everything is. Um Yes, yeah, thank you uh, for taking this time um, for allowing me to speak um, on this important uh, measure. Um, I just wanted to call in and voice my um, opposition for AO 202065. Um, just on the basis of um, First Amendment rights, um, reading through it, obviously I'm not a lawyer, but just a concerned parent. Um, the high things that I've highlighted that I've noticed is the uh, men's, sorry, let me step away from my, my three kids and come back. Um, are the mental health decisions for minors should just be left to the patients, the parents, and the counselors, and not to the government to license one viewpoint? Um, what specifically um, concerns me is the First Amendment uh, issue. Um, let's see. It seems like it's burdening free speech, violating the free exercise clause regarding religion. 
um, some who seek counseling to address sexual orientation or gender identity do so for religious reasons, and that is that their religion informs them that they should not act upon same-sex attraction or that they should seek to live uh, consistent with their God-given biological sex. And some counselors who offer such counseling likewise do for religious re reasons as well. Um, AO 2020-65 violates the rights of parents and minors to explore all options related to their sexual sexuality and identity. The First Amendment not only protects the right to free speak, but it also protects the right to hear and receive it. Uh, given the widespread debate over the best course of treatment for their children experiencing sex attraction and uh, uh, um, gender confusion, minors and parents alike benefit from having access to the full spectrum of available knowledge. Um, to me, it undermines the individual freedom through the restrictions on counseling and other forms of speech. Um, individuals who, for example, seek affirmation of their same-sex attraction or are looking to transition to a gender other than their biological sex are able to procure counseling services and medical interventions, whereas those uh, who seek to live consistent with their biological sex are denied uh, counseling and other resources to help them achieve that goal. Um, it seems, after reading over it, it seems likely unconstitutional because it engages in a viewpoint, uh, viewpoint of discrimination. It's uh, impermissibly vague and demonstrates a hostility towards religious beliefs regarding sexual, sexuality and identity. It limits the freedom to explore all counseling options and interferes with the liberty of patients to choose the counseling they believe to best further personal growth. And I uh, appreciate your time. I just wanted to make sure that my voice was heard uh, during this uh, public testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So have a great day. You too. Next, we have Joyce Zirkel. Next, we have Pastor Leon D. May. Hello. Hi, Pastor May. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public... <laughs> Uh, we are on public testimony for AO 2020-65. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Allow, my, allow me to get my preliminary, preliminaries out of the way. I'm grateful and thankful for each of you. And uh, I'm Pastor Leon D. May the first. And uh, I would say that I have uh, uh, heard some good preaching on yesterday and some not so good preaching as it relates to this. And I was with you from five to midnight so to speak, and uh, I do want to oppose this amendment. One gentleman posed on the, on uh, uh, he, he did not side with equity, but opposed on equality, but I want to oppose it on both with uh, equity uh, being the quality of being fair and impartial with this ordinance fails on, and then on equality, equal status, rights, and opportunity, which this ordinance uh, fails on, and I've heard much about the Constitution, freedom of speech, and religion, and I'm in agreement with much of that, uh, but I think this is going down a, a slippery slope of uh, big government, and many of you ran opposed to that, and uh, to, to, to lift this ordinance up would be uh, a vote for big government. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me give you an object uh, illustration, if you will. If you had, uh, many of you are familiar in the olden days with Crisco, we used to call it Lord, but it's shortening a can of Lord. And if you take two of those gallon cans and mix it up with two jars each of mayonnaise and you hold one out on one end and one on the other, and on one end somebody has a fatal attraction uh, to mayonnaise and Lord and just need a, a little push to get there 
and uh, they can get the kind of counseling that they need. On the other hand, uh, someone has a, a quasi-attraction, don't know if they want to, you know, do a one-off or try it or remain where they are uh, in relation to the Crisco and the Lord, and they cannot get the kind of counseling that they would need to, to refrain from that. And uh, so uh, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that uh, each individual parent or guardian in, in consult with their minor should have the opportunity to choose what kind of uh, counsel uh, they would receive and by whom. And so I think that should be equal going forth. I would say at, at worst, uh, or rather at best, this ordinance should be opposed. And uh, at worst, I'm in agreement because that was a concern of mine with uh, youth pastor I heard on yesterday, uh, there at least ought to be a, a, some kind of amendment of protection for clergy, churches, and religious organizations in regard to this. Uh, so I'm praying, uh, my prayer and hope for the assembly is that God would grant you the wisdom to do what is right relative to this ordinance, and uh, blessings of the Lord be upon you. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Next, we have Eric Marcellus. You've reached 907-444. Next, we have Jacob Powell. Next, we have Annie Macy. Remember. This is Annie. Hi, Miss Macy. This is Felix Rivera. Uh, you are with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on AO, uh, public testimony for AO 2020-65. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. I uh, oppose AO 65, and I have a lot to say. I spent some time trying to figure out which parts to say, and I'm just going to speak from my heart. It's interesting how people who do not possess the ability to create children want to have power over parents who created children. I wonder then what kind of position they were allowed to be in as children by people who should have protected them. I wonder what happened to them that possesses them to attempt to recreate such dysfunction, confusion, abuse to minor toddlers, children, and teens. 
I wonder how many important adults in their life had to model such passivity, ignorance, and shame towards their own confusion, dysfunction, and abuse in order to attempt this spread of more hate, hurt, and abuse onto others. Hurting people hurt people. And this is only an overreach, a form of communication aimed at receiving the healthy and appropriate attention they deserve. But we're denied by adults, and let's name it what it is. It's absolute abuse in the making to attempt to recreate your own hurt and loneliness on whom? Minor, babies, toddlers, children, and teens. I'm sorry that the adults who should have helped you did not. I'm sorry that no one helped you when you needed it most, but to take that right away from parents is only spreading the hate and the abuse further and will not serve as justice for your own hurt. Instead, parents who understand the importance of protecting children and their precious natural innocence will be the people who oppose this. I trust that through this process, these people can find reconciliation and a beautiful, natural, normal example of how parents are responsible to protect innocent children which is what they need after all now, isn't it? It's an important thing to factor. No one hardly ever brings this up. There are real disorders existing like Turner syndrome and other intersex conditions causing people to be born having a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fall into the typical definition of male or female. And I ask you to educate yourself about the reality of these parents advocating for help for their child. However, parents who cater to children claiming other sources for their desires besides a diagnostic, diagnosed genetic condition are undermining real families who have to make legitimate, difficult choices for their children born with intersex conditions. People with abnormalities of development deserve to be heard and only a parent can find the help their children need. This ordinance will create even greater challenges for those who legitimately seek and require help. However, Flippant gender changes driven by psychological and psychosocial problems, often due to abuse. Already, there's already a law for abuse. Please remember that. Apologies for or mental uh, problems interrupting, ma'am. Are hurting, but your time is up. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Eugene Carl Haberman. Hi, Mr. Haberman. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. All right. Good evening. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. I follow the public process. When the public process an appropriate decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest. Um, personally, I've been torn, but I listen attentively to the testimony on this issue. At first, I wasn't going to testify but I decided it was important to do so. One, for the role I played for a number of years dealing with process. It's important that the process is done right so that the conversation with the people on issues that you have are going to be handled in such a way that people are going to be more comfortable with the decision and supportive. But the process that you've done on this issue, particularly this issue, is a, is a shame. It's just a sham. Because your doors are closed from the people to be in the room. The doors are closed. Where can you have a conversation on an issue such as this when the doors are closed in the public to enter the meeting? This is not the time for this to happen and to make decisions such as this. And it appears by the items on the agenda, I know it's a legal counsel. It says legal in turn, no name provided. But I'd also like to make a note, too, as I heard from previous testimony by assembly members calling for, would you be interested in being an expert witness? What makes an expert witness by assembly members? And until recently, I don't recall ever assembly members ever saying expert witness. But I have been an expert witness on the public process. I'm on my ninth year full time on that. And you look a blind way in previous administrations to comply with the open meetings laws and so forth. 
I also would like to say is it hurts me to hear some of the comments that were said and the frustration in certain parties we're having. But it hurts me, too, that is this the way to make a decision and approve such a decision at this time, even if the, even of the seriousness of the concerns of certain parties? This is not the way to do it. Not at all. You need to postpone it indefinitely, which means you need to kill it. You need to come back at a time when you can really hold meetings on any issues and any legislation you have out there tonight or in the future. You can't do it. But you're going to ignore what I say, and the press is going to ignore what I say over the years, and that's why the public process continues to deteriorate, and more and more frustration of the people are saying to themselves, what's the use? And now you're going one more step further. So... I leave you with this. Please postpone it definitely. Open those doors. Have a forum for people to hear from each other respectfully. Listen to each other before you make this to before you make decisions. And I want to make this key thing. It's not just the idea of people talking to you, but when they talk to you in closing, it allows an opportunity for the public to listen to each other and learn from each other. And you certainly are not doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Michelle Deering. Hi, Ms. Deering. This is Felix Rivera. Uh, you're with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll grab my paper here. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, my name is Michelle Deering. Uh, I've got bachelor's degrees in psychology, sociology, did master's work in popular culture, earned my doctorate in animal behavior. Uh, I've been a social worker in Hawaii and published in behavioral and natural history from research in California and Alaska, taught at the University of Davis and, uh, in California and Illis College in Barrow. I'm now a Catholic homeschooling mother of six, ranges age 8, 10 to 23, so I'm speaking from the perspective of a counselor, a behavioral scientist, a teacher, a parent, a Christian and I'm Alaskan. Um, this, this bill is bad for children, bad for families, bad for the First Amendment rights of therapists and counselors, and bad for the culture. Uh, first, the professional opposition to conversion therapy is not universal. Um, while some of the assembly are claiming that conver conversion therapy is scientifically proven to harm children, that is not the case. Um, opposition to the therapy is far from universal, and the professionals who support this therapy are censored or canceled, as there are hundreds of formula transgender persons who regret their transitions and lament the fact there was no one to help them deal with the issues underlying their gender dysphoria. Second, outlying certain types of therapies threatens the health and the future of children. Gender dysphoria is generally a temporary phase in a child's life. Recent studies by Thomas Steensma et al indicated that over 84% of gender dysphoric children no longer had dysphoria in late adolescence or childhood. And hormones and surgery are permanent and dangerous. Surgery can obviously go wrong, and artificial hormones are often carcinogenic. Um, some members are claiming that puberty blockers reduce suicide. However, the study in pediatrics journal that's usually used to support this claim actually shows that children who received puberty blockers were twice as likely to have been hospitalized as a result of a suicide attempt as those who did not. Um, finally, sex changes treatments are still at best experimental, and calling them evidence-based is misleading. So this audience would essentially force our children to become guinea pigs. Um, my third point is that the ordinance would damage family dynamics. Parents know and love their children more than any counselor or legislator ever could, but this ordinance would drive a wedge between children, their parents, their siblings, and instead of empowering the most important advocates in a child's life, it would neutralize them if they did not bow to the state's viewpoint. And fourth, this ordinance is institutionalized religious discrimination. 
uh, many parents, children, therapists have deeply held beliefs about how human persons are created and preventing them from living and working in accord with their beliefs is an attack on their First Amendment rights and religious viewpoint discrimination cannot be tolerated in Alaska or in America. Um, there are children who are or become unhappy being same-sex attracted or dysphoric and they desperately want help aligning their attraction or identity with their biological sex. Outlawing this personal choice is inexcusable. And outlawing parental involvement that does not affirm a politically correct point of view is cruel and arrogant. Pretending that children or young teens at most, the most physically and psychologically volatile times of their lives already know what they want with the rest of their lives is at the very least reckless. And to straightjacket therapists who have the ability to help these children. Apologies for interrupting, ma'am, but your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Please reject this ordinance. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back through, and um, we will do second calls for the folks we missed. Uh, so first we have Paige Henry. Hi, Ms. Henry. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I just would like to say I feel like this is a, a impressive overstep on our personal liberties to govern our family how we see fit, to raise our children how we see fit. And I think it takes away options instead of giving them. And that is all I have to say on that. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Dr. Chris Reynolds. Hi, you reached the clinical office of Dr. Chris. Next, we have Sherry Laurie. Hi, this is Sherry. Please leave a message and I'll call you back real soon. Next, we have Tony Thomas. Hello? Hello? Hi, Ms. Thomas. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for calling back. I feel very strongly that teachers, social workers, medical providers, religious leaders, have an obligation to help our children in making good decisions for their futures, including sexuality. I'm a practicing nurse practitioner, and I care for children on a daily basis. Decisions to change their sexual orientation from what they genetically and physically are from birth is an enormous decision that will impact the rest of their lives. Children are vulnerable to what they see and hear at home, on TV, in classrooms, in churches, at family gatherings, 
and amongst their friends and neighbors. All these things shape their decision making, which will define who they are. We have all been children and know through our different stages of growing how our minds and opinions changed frequently, even radically at times, as we grew older and more experienced. I have taken care of teenagers confused about their sexuality. I feel all this push in the media portraying same-sex relations as normal is not reality. I have had high school girls and young women want to experiment with dating girls because of bad relationships with, not, with young men, not realizing cruelty, selfishness, sexual abuse, and unfaithfulness can exist in all types of relations. They are confused and need help understanding relationships of any kind. From my medical standpoint, these facts disturb me. No procreation with relationship of the same sex. HIV epidemic is driven by sexual contact and is concentrated particularly in gay men or men who have sex with men. According to CDC, LGBT youth are more likely than heterosexual students to report high levels of drug use and feelings of depression. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 24, and lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth in grades 7 to 12 are twice as likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. LGBT are at higher risk for bullying, teasing, and physical violence than their heterosexual peers. This affects their performance in school and their mental health. LGBT youth are at greater risk for homelessness than heterosexual youth. These risks are based on scientific studies which are easily found online. In fairness to these children, we need to make sure they are making decisions with good, honest, and factual information so they don't pick a difficult pathway without being well-educated. Please do not call all conversations about sexual health conversion therapy, which is actually just sharing the facts in a caring environment. Tony Thomas, a nurse practitioner. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go back to a couple of folks who um, we have better information for. So first, uh, Dr. Chris Reynolds. Hello, this is Chris. Hi, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for EO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, also, thank you for um, for your service. I know that you folks had a late night last night, and, um, and you're back at it today. So thank you so much for your public service. Um, if you'd just give me a second here to get to my notes. So uh, my name is Dr. Chris Reynolds. I'm a licensed psychologist in Alaska. I practice here in Anchorage. But tonight, I'm coming to you representing ACPA, which is the Alaska chapter of the American Psychological Association. Uh, a little bit about ACPA. We're a politically diverse organization that supports the autonomy of parental rights. We support the freedom of religious expression. We have position statements and ethical mandates for our members to back that up. Um, we're also an organization that back in 2009 wrote a position statement in express opposition to the provision of conversion therapies by our members. So the APA took that position because we're first and foremost a scientific body and the science led clearly in the direction of conversion therapy posing serious, a serious public health risk. Here's what we know. Conversion therapy simply doesn't work. People don't change their sexual orientation because of conversations that they have with therapists. But more importantly, conversion therapy is associated with significantly higher levels of depression in patients, including increased incidence of suicide. But I'd like to turn to speak to some of the other testimony that I've heard both last night and, to, and today. I'm, I'm deeply disturbed to hear that some of my licensed mental health colleagues have spoken out in support of the practice of conversion therapy. Let me be clear here. These professionals are acting outside of the ethics of their own professions. Someone can get the impression from testimony tonight or last night and today that there's some debate within the field of psychology as to whether conversion therapy is an ethical or effective treatment. 
there may be debate in political arenas, but there simply isn't debate within the healthcare community about the clear danger to individuals that conversion therapy presents. As evidence, I'd like to direct the assembly members to a document that's titled Declaration on the Impropriety and Dangers of Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Change Efforts. You can probably guess the, the nature of this document, but I, I want to highlight that it's co-authored by the following organizations. The American Psychiatric Association, the World Health Association, the World Health Organization, the National Education Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Counseling Association, the American Academy of, of, of Physicians Assistants, the National Association of School Nurses. I could go on, uh, but there's more more organizations to list than I have time. So in conclusion, I'd just like to reemphasize that it's the view of the Alaska Psychological Association and the American Psychological Association that the provision of conversion therapy poses a serious health risk to vulnerable populations. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you. Um, we have some ambient noise. Could you tell me your name again, please? My name is Dr. Chris Reynolds. Okay, Dr. Reynolds, could you tell me a little bit um, more about your background? Uh, again, we have a lot of extra noise, and so I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not you. It's here in the chamber. I apologize. Oh, got it, got it. Yep. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a psychologist uh, licensed in the state of Alaska. I've been um, practicing therapy for a couple of decades. I'm one of the four uh, licensed or uh, certified sex therapists in Alaska, which just means that I have special education and training in the area of human sexuality. Um, thank you. May I go ahead, Mr. Chair? Thank you. Um, are you familiar with um, the definition of child abuse in Alaska? Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but yes, I am. Is it your opinion that um, conversion therapy, as you're familiar with it, um, could constitute child abuse? That's a good question. I, I don't know that I'm, in the, I'm the best person to answer that question. I think probably the social workers, uh, particularly down at the Office of Children's Services, have more expertise in providing definition for what is and isn't child abuse. Um, but speaking to the research about what we know about conversion therapy, uh, I, I, can, I can say with confidence that uh, the provision of conversion therapy uh, constitutes a serious ethical breach for mental health professionals because uh, because the, the professional organizations has, have deemed that a harmful practice. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, again, thank you for your testimony and uh, your assistance in the process of this conversation. You mentioned OCS. Do you know what OCS's position is in this conversation by chance? I do not. All right. I do not. Again, thank you for your testimony. Sure. Um, I don't know if it's prudent, but um, I, I do have, I would like to offer some clarification about what seems to be some miscommunication about um, about the role of the therapist in uh, and uh, what we're, uh, what the therapist will still be allowed and not allowed to do under the provisions of this, uh, well, Mr. of Rounds, this AO. But Mr. Rounds, uh, this is Mr. Constant. Would you please uh, help clarify for me a bit about the relationship of the therapist that you were just describing. Thank you. Oh, th thank you for the for the prompt. So there seems to be a, a misconception as I listen to public testimony that therapists will not be able to help you who have uh, um, a discordant experience between their attraction to same-sex individuals and their religious uh, ideals. Nothing in this ordinance would prevent a therapist from helping a, a youth with that kind of angst from addressing that angst. We, we would just be prevented from providing conversion therapy to address that angst. But there, there's dozens of other ways in which we can help that youth uh, 
deal with the anxiety produced by that and to, uh, and to seek health and balance given that discordance. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't say anything about uh, whether the therapist would be, uh, uh, um, you know, the therapist doesn't get to pull for heterosexuality or homosexuality in the client. Uh, I'm not sure if I was clear, but did, did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, Ms. Chair, can I ask a question? Sorry, I, couldn't, I can't. I don't see how to get the request to speak on my mission. Sure. Um, so we'll go ahead and show you. Go ahead, Mr. Weddleton. Uh, so, Dr. Reynolds, are you there still? Oh, sorry. She has it. So good. Hello, this is Chris. Hi, this is Chris. Dr. Reynolds, this is Felix Rivera. You're with the Anchorage Assembly again. We had a, a, one more question for you from Mr. Weddleton. Terrific. Uh, thanks. Um, what is conversion therapy? Conversion therapy is the attempt to uh, change the sexual orientation of the uh, patient through, through therapeutic services. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again. Next, uh, we're going to go back to Sherry Lori. Hi, Ms. Lori. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you checking my testimony. Um, let me turn this off. Um, this is regarding yeah, AO 2020-65, um, and I just appreciate the chance to talk to Assembly members. After reading this ordinance concerning conversion therapy, I'm very much against taking away minors' right to receive the fullness of sound counsel from a professional individual trained and licensed in counseling. There are several questions that come to my attention as I read this, starting with the first paragraph. It states there's, there's no official way of backing for the research stated in this initial premise. There is, however, data that shows a higher rate of suicide in individuals who have changed their biological gender and amongst the LGBTQ community. Um, what is contemporary science that you're referencing? Again, where is the research? The condition of gender identity issues is commonly called gender dysphoria and is noted in the DSM. Gender dysphoria, according to the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, is defined as marked incongruence between their experienced and expressed gender and the one they were assigned at birth. It's previously termed gender identity disorder. Um, and that was as of May 7th, 2020. And then it talks about compelling interests. Um, a parent of a minor has the most compelling interest in the child's welfare, not the Assembly of Anchorage, in which there are three members underwriting this ordinance that are from the LGBTQ community, and they th themselves have no children. Since when does the municipality need to exercise police power in the area of counseling? Is there even one case in the municipality where the assembly has had to step in and exercise police power on behalf of a minor due to the parent seeking professional counseling for the minor? Um, 16.140.020A, um, I believe this whole premise is wrong. Um, the way this is written is under the assumption that the child is all, has already declared they are of the opposite sex and have homosexual tendencies even at a young age. If a parent is seeking counseling for a minor or a minor is seek, seeking counseling, it may be because of confusion as to, the very, to very real feelings. However, that does not determine the gender and sexuality of the minor based on feelings or emotion. This would be the reason they are seeking counsel, just as anyone has a right to, to process their feelings and emotions. It cannot be presumed that they are already um, transgender or homosexual. There are many times these feelings and emotions have risen out of early childhood sexual abuse. 16.140.020B um, um, 
It says, we've been told that this not, doesn't apply to religious counsel, but many pastors and lay leaders are licensed or certified by their denominations or other organizations that offer training. If a pastor is licensed by a church, will this limit what a pastor can and cannot do to offer counsel to their congregation? What about religious freedoms and beliefs? If a youth pastor talks in front of a group of students encourage them to follow the biblical teachings regarding such things as premarital sex, does that constitute Apologies an encouragement? Apologies for interrupting. Uh, your time is up, but I do have a question for you. Ms. Allard? Sure. Thank you, Chair. Depending how she answers, there might be a follow-up question. Thank you. Ms. Lori, this is Ms. Allard. I have a question for you, please. Sure. Do you know of any individuals who have struggled with their sexual orientation? Um, I meet many of them. Yeah, here. Can we do a follow-up? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What was the result of their struggles? Um, when they have gone through some of the classes um, here, it usually always comes back to early childhood abuse. And um, some have chosen to uh, come out of those struggles. Um, a lot of it is for protection. Um, so I, I've seen people, when they have made a decision one way um, or been involved in a homosexual relationship, that they've chosen something else when they find when they ad address the real issue inside, the, the issue of childhood molestation. And, and I've seen that several times. And so I think if they were able to have been counseled as a child and, and looked at those things, because what we're doing, we're talking about emotions and feelings. And sometimes they just need to be able to get those out and sort it out. So, and I just don't, I think a parent has, should have the ability to determine that for their child. Ms. Laurie, this will be my last question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that counseling has helped those children? Yes. Can you elaborate, please? Um, I believe that it has when, particularly with pastors, and, I, you know, the thing about um, religious leaders being okay that they can counsel, well, a lot of them are licensed, so they are counseling as a licensed counselor. Um, but oftentimes, and I've said, see it more in the youth group uh, scenario where, because um, I had teenagers and, and the things that I saw them and their friends go through, um, when they received counseling and, and guidance, they were able to sort through it. Now, you know, today I don't know what some of the outcomes are, but at the time when they were going through it, it helped them. So are you saying that regardless of their sexual orientation, that counseling does help either way? That'll be your last question. I do believe it does. It helps them sort through the emotions and feelings of the moment as a minor. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have Wendy Perkins. Hello. Hi, Ms. Perkins. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on a public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three yes. minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, um, I just would like to just state that I am for counseling and helping people. And um, I know that we're all different. We have come from different perspectives and viewpoints. But ultimately, I really believe that we're way more similar than we all think. And I feel like everybody needs love and support. And um, that's not always something that, you know, just because somebody might be wanting to be struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction, I don't feel like there's a whole ton of platforms to express that and to find help in that. And I think it takes really special people, like special counselors, special people that that will really sit down and, and allow somebody that's struggling in that way to express themselves and to help them find the freedom that they choose and that um, is best for them. And so I just really wanted to... Um, 
strongly support counseling. And obviously, anything that has anything to do with illegal activity, like abusing people or hurting people or uh, forcing people to um, conform to whatever, I mean, is not okay. And obviously, I mean, I don't think anybody anybody in their right mind would support something like that. But um, So anyways, I just wanted to put that out there. And also, um, with that, just our First Amendment rights, it's, you know, flat out illegal to, um, you know, gag somebody that wants to have help or somebody that's willing to help another person. And so anyways, um, yeah, I, I, that's kind of my two cents. So thank you so much for calling me and and hearing my, what I have to say. Absolutely. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Next, we have Joyce Zirkel. Next, we have Eric Marcellus. You've reached 907. And last, we have Jacob Powell. Hi there. Hi, Mr. Powell. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, I'd like to speak in support of AO 2020-65. First of all, thank you for submitting this item. As a mostly straight cisgender man, I don't have first-hand experience with conversion therapy. But I do have close professional and personal friends who've been harmed by conversion therapy and seen the lasting emotional and mental effect it had. Absolutely counteractive to the intent of any kind of therapy, which should be allowing individuals to understand and navigate their own thoughts, emotions, and feelings. And I think that the definition of conversion therapy and the way the ordinance is written is crucial, and so if you don't mind, I'd like to read a bit of it. Quote, sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts do not include counseling that does not seek to change sexual orientation or gender identity, and that B, provides acceptance, support, and understanding to the person, end quote. So if I'm interpreting that correctly, I want to apply this to my own life and check in to make sure I'm understanding the scope of this ban correctly. So as I mentioned, I'm a mostly straight man who's never done anything more than flirt with a couple of guys who I found attractive, but I had and have no desire for anything else. And I was 17 when I first thought, huh, I might be attracted to this guy I met at a church retreat. And looking back, I thought, huh, that was odd. After experiencing that a couple more times, living another several years of life, I now know that sexuality is a spectrum that's totally normal, and that's just the way it is for me, and I'm happy with that. If I went to counseling as a minor at the time to talk about what that means or how that feels, as long as my therapist did not have the specific goal of changing those feelings and provided acceptance and support and facilitated my personal growth, that would be permitted under this ordinance. If I found those feelings distressing and wanted to better understand them so I could maybe better focus on the women I was attracted to, that seems like that would also be allowed, and that sure seems like it's okay. 
if I, however, told my parents about those feelings, and God forbid they sent me to a therapist whose goal it was to change my sexual orientation, or even if I told that therapist that that was my goal, that would certainly have been extraordinarily traumatic, caused an enormous amount of distress about these feelings, and wouldn't have really helped anyone. And also worth noting, if there was a situation where I was actively struggling with my gender identity and sexual orientation, I would not be compelled by this ordinance in counseling as an adult or as a minor to think one way or another, and all it would do is place guardrails using civil, not criminal penalties, on the people who we as a society trust to counsel our children. And I'd like to echo the comments of a gentleman yesterday who pointed out that this is a carefully written ordinance that is targeted specifically to avoid the real and dangerous harms that can result from subjecting minors to abusive conversion therapy and to ensure that professional providers who we trust with our children are not allowed to carry out these practices on minors unable to consent to them. A breach of the trusting and cooperative relationship that mental health professionals should have with our clients and society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, with that, we do have one more uh, individual, Brienne. Hi, uh, Brienne. This is Felix Rivera. Uh, you are here with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for AO 2020-65. You have three minutes. Welcome. This is actually Cade, but but it is my testimony. Got it. Okay. Okay. Hello. My name is Cade Davis, and I'm a minor in the LGBTQ community. I'm one of the youth that the ordinance would directly impact. I support the ordinance and I can hope I can show you why you should too. Conversion therapy, also known as reparative therapy, can lead to depression, anxiety, suicide, and more. Conversion therapists use a variety of shaming, emotionally traumatic, or physical painful stimuli to make their victims associate those stimuli with their LGBTQ identities. No matter how much someone has to harm, hurt, shame, or traumatize someone, that's what person would still be gay, trans, or whoever they are. Being gay isn't something you could just shame out of us. We will be we will still be who we are no matter how much you, we hurt us, and no amount of quote-unquote therapy will change who we are as people. When we say no conversion therapy, we aren't saying injecting small children with hormones or getting rid of body parts. We're saying no emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. I'm pansexual and non-binary, and no amount of shame, trauma, or hurt could ever change that. Making it illegal to have conversion therapy for minors would be best for our city. I learned that it is okay to be who I am because I have a loving, support loving and supportive family, friends, and community. It isn't humane, it isn't fair or humane to have children, teens, or adults subjected to this, to have to fear being sent to this. It will be, it will make people scared to be who they are because their parents or other adults could send them to this hurtful, inhumane therapy. It causes so many people depression, anxiety, and suicide. Conversion therapy doesn't work whether you're trying to get the gay out of someone or their gender. The founder of Christian version therapy, McCray Gain, came out as gay as over a year ago. He says that he was wrong and that the cycle of shame has to stop. We are just being ourselves and we aren't hurting anyone. It has been scientifically proven that we can't change who we are. Conversion therapy was built on the notion that being gay is a mental illness. It is not. This is a quote from the TrevorProject.org. In, in a study by San Francisco State University, le lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth were rejected by their families and caregivers due to their identities were nearly six more times more likely to report high levels of depression and more than eight times more likely to have attempted suicide than compared to their youth from accepting or affirming families and caregivers. I have heard a lot about parental rights, but what about youth's rights? And I also have heard a lot about taking rights away, but they should want to take our youth away. Please vote in support of this ordinance for youth like me. I would like to thank the people who put this ordinance together. Sexuality and gender is not a choice. It is who we are. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. With that, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. So, just like we normally do, we're going to go through amendments. Then I understand there are a variety of uh, experts, subject matter experts, that we will call for questions after amendments. And then we'll do any final closing comments that folks might have. So, I'm just going to go in order of the amendments. 
So first we have amendment number one by assembly member Weddleton. Is there a motion? I, I move um, Weddleton amendment one parts A and C. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton. Um, thanks. And just, I, I'm not moving part B because I see that uh, amendment number, I look forward to amendment number 12 and I find it be necessary. And I just, um, regarding this and then other amendments that I'll offer with the enjoyable background music, um, you know, this is one of many ordinances that have been proposed that have been very challenging, I think. I've certainly spent a lot of time reading and learning and it's kind of an arena I came in pretty ignorant, might still be ignorant, but I've certainly learned a lot. And um, the and I, I guess I come away very sympathetic, too. I think the basic notion of conversion therapy to someone who um, is LGBTQ has is, is got to be fundamentally um, offensive, that um, it kind of says you're broken. And, and I can understand where that's a problem. Uh, but I've also kind of as I looked at is, is we look at this and this focuses on sexual and gender identity, but we have all kinds of identities and we are made up of a lot of them. And a lot of times they are contradictory and they don't, they don't mess well. And that's when we run into trouble and we need some kind of counseling. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. So most of the amendments that I put forward just kind of broaden that and say we can't restrict this broader view of counseling that looks at all our different identities and the way they would work together. Um, so as I've been challenged learning about this stuff, I, I hope that as you guys, the sponsors look at this, also be challenged to accept that, you know, there are, um, and as we heard in testimony, lots of different ways that therapy can go. So the first, um, oh, did I get a second? I'm sorry, I moved it. Okay, sorry, I'm rambling here. I didn't even know. Was that the second? Oh, okay. Um, so the warehouses are actually just pulled from some um, things that I think are linked to lots of the testimony that we got in emails and brought in the uh, um, warehouses a bit. And basically sexual development is... Comp Do, should I read these? or Because I mean, they posted and they've been available, right, to the public. Okay. Um, so basically just uh, acknowledges that it's very complex and that we are many identities. And then the second one is fairly lengthy, but it is just pulled out of um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry that actually has a fairly broad view of what our identities are. And um, I think just kind of brackets or enhances the presentation that's in the whereases. Um, the, uh, that, that's Amendment A. And Amendment C adds to the exemptions for what is counted as um, conversion therapy. And generally it just allows, um, I don't think it takes away from it at all, but just shows that I think of what is intended is that a broad conversation recognizing all of our different identities is allowed, under, um, is permitted. Thank you. Um, and actually, what I think I'm going to do before we dive into these amendments, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, take a 20-minute, our regular 20-minute break, and then we'll come back and do these amendments. They just got quiet. We should take advantage. Let's vote on this and then break.
Okay. So, we're back at amendment number one. Mr. Weddleton, did you have anything else to add? Um, I just um, briefly, and thanks for the intermission. You know, we got a um, letter from, um, oh, shoot, I'm sorry, the fellow spoke at our work session. Uh, the uh, attorney with the Trevor Project, and I appreciate his comments on it, and respect anyone who I mean, makes his life mission to prevent suicide. And I mean, they think it seems like a good thing, and he's got comments on all of the amendments. And on one A, he says, "Well, it's true; it's a distraction, and and I, it's not really a distraction." And as I said in my previous comments, you know, it is meant to broaden the view of it a bit. Um, and then I didn't do B on C. Um, again, he said it would dilute the effectiveness, and, and there's really nothing there that would dilute the effectiveness. Again, it's just to broaden the discussion, and um, the intent isn't to dilute or to change, really, but to make this thing cover more ground. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson on the amendment. On the amendment, I'm glad that Mr. Weddleson brought up um, Casey Pick's memo. I thought that that really described sort of my feelings as well on this amendment. I think it just really does nothing except for take away from the purpose of this ordinance and um, except for potentially confused people. I don't really understand why you would add something talking about a diagnostic and statistic manual of mental disorders. I'm not familiar with that manual. Um, and using words like unwanted sexual attractions, I think, um, perpetuate stereotypes about LGBT people. And um, those words are problematic, and I will not support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant on the amendment. Thank you. I will identify with the comments of Ms. Quinn Davidson and ask my peers not to support this amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on amendment number one. Members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. Mr. Perez Verdia? That amendment fails six to four. Next, we have amendment number two by Assemblymember Weddleton. Is there a motion? I move um, amendment number two. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Weddleton? Um, I, this also uh, has, a co this has two parts, 2A and 2B. And 2A um, adds to, on section one, page three, begin at line 11 on, in C adds a phrase near the end, or assist a person undergoing gender transition. And that is, um, you know, just fundamentally, as the whole ordinance is, is to protect children from maltreatment. And B adds um, an additional section D that says, parent and family rights, nothing in this chapter will infringe on the rights of parents or legal guardians to help and counsel their minor children regarding their ethical, religious, or other viewpoints regarding sexual orientation or gender identity. 
And in fact, we just heard at the end of the te testimony, I think it was Dr. Reynolds said that, you know, that, that that is already implied in here, but I don't think it was clear. And if that's supposed to be the case, uh, we need to make it crystal clear because many of the people who spoke um, brought these points up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I move to bifurcate these items 2A and 2B. Second. Thank you. Um, I hope that the members will support the bifurcation. We can take them up individually. I can support one, part one support the other. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson, did you want to speak on the motion to bifurcate? Yeah, actually, I was going to make the same motion. So thank you, Chris, for doing that. I'd really like to support the second part, but I can't support the first part. Seeing no further discussion, is there any opposition to bifurcation? Okay, hearing none, we can take these up separately. So we're going to go ahead and start with 2A. Is there any further discussion on 2A? Mr. Constant. Thank you. <clears throat> I would ask my peers not to support this one. Uh, I understand that it seems this argument has been made, oh, it's not fair, you're only doing this and that is different. But here's what's different about this. The issue of conversion therapy is that across the board in all of the guilds, you find that people have determined that conversion therapy, moving someone from where their identity is to another identity is not helpful and not healthy. Whereas affirming somebody's identity is in fact within the science and it's a proven therapy. And somebody made a point yesterday for me that made it really clear that when you try to convert somebody from who they are into something else. It's like giving them poison, but when you try to help somebody address their innate uh, being as they are and support them in that way, that it's like giving them medicine. And the statistics prove it out that when people are helped to, to be at peace with the, who they are, that they actually have healthier outcomes. And so I would ask the members to say no to this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll support this because I think one of the things that's important to remember is that we're talking about a minor, and there are so many extreme things that could happen to somebody undergoing, undergoing uh, gender transition that are permanent. And this, the idea of not allowing somebody really the time to make that proper decision, i.e. after they're an adult, um, would really be a travesty. So I think we need this in here recognizing that one way to protect children is for somebody to too quickly go through this um, kind of a, any kind of a procedure. You know, one of the things that, that I've read is that anybody going through any kind of gender transformation is going to go through a lot of counseling. They're going to go through a lot of practicing. They're going to go through a lot of role playing uh, to make sure that that's the right decision. Um, a 12 year old or a 15 year old or, you know, he, actually even anybody I would think under 25 would probably have difficulty with this anyway. So I think the idea of making sure that this would not be pressured on an individual of that young of an age is probably the wiser thing to do. So I'll support this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail the argument I have. I think it's not necessary. I'll just say I, I oppose this amendment, and I hope other folks do, too. Point of order. I think we're just on the bifurcation, right? Or is that? No, we already well, So that was approved by consent. And yes. I'm sorry. So the, I'm speaking only to, to 2A. I, I oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allard. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to support this as well. And I'm just going to say it. Um, there are members on the assembly who don't have children and aren't parents. And this is actually causing the reverse. What I mean by that is we're being asked not to support conversion therapy yet. The reverse is happening, and we are to believe that the pressure of us standing up for our children's rights is, is exactly the same. So you're asking us not to support conversion therapy, but yet 
we're supporting something we don't believe in either. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Um, so I oppose this amendment. Um, as a parent, I want to be able to um, allow my child, should she so choose, um, to explore all aspects of her gender identity. And um, if this were to pass, that wouldn't be possible. So um, I think that's that's a dangerous road to go down um, because we haven't heard about the harmful effects on um, children who choose to do that, we have heard about the harmful effects about conversion therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaPrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a mother of three, part of being a parent is unconditional love for one's child. And um, given that under the law, minors cannot have gender transition surgery, um, undergoing gender transition encompasses, I think, primarily counseling, and in certain cases, perhaps some, um, you know, hormone therapy. But there are so many instances. I would caution against anything that has repercussions that we don't want. And I, I mean, for me, this is about unconditional love of my child and supporting who they are. So I, I, I will not be supporting the first part of this amendment. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote on 2A. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? No. Mr. Perez Verdia? No. That amendment fails seven to four. We now have amendment two B before us. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Ms. Zalatel. Okay. I have a question for the sponsor. Um, what do we mean by the rights of parents or legal guardians to help and counsel or counsel their minor children? Do we mean personally or are we talking about seeking counseling i just don't know what what the breadth of the intent of this is i i the, my intent is to be broad i mean you know you talk to your kids and you talk to your friends and neighbors and talk to whoever i would consider it fairly unlimited so i would not want to restrict it um if i could also add uh in um the comments from the Trevor Project, he did not um, comment on this, so he did not say it was bad. He just moved on in his comments. So I don't know if that was a word of support or he just didn't care. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. We have, since the beginning of this conversation, stated that there is no intent to take a parent's right to have any conversation with their child and uh, or any kind of framework whether it's conversation or whatever modality of training and love that the parent wants to provide for their child our opponents the people who support conversion therapy have framed this thing in a number of ways that just aren't true and so this amendment explicitly states that which was already in place in this ordinance and so there's no reason not to support it, and it provides some comfort to parents who might actually take the time to read this and go beyond the rhetoric, the spin that's been out in the community. So I do recommend supporting this amendment. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also support this amendment, and, you know, like Chris, I guess I just want to make clear to 
our community and to those who haven't been supportive of this ordinance that it doesn't infringe on parents' rights, but it protects children. And there's nothing in this ordinance that would keep parents from talking with their children. And so I completely support this amendment. I like to have it explicit in there. And yeah, I'll be voting yes. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on amendment number 2B. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. <laughs> that amendment passes 10 to 1. Next, we have amendment number 3 by Assembly Member Kennedy. Is there a motion? Move amendment number 3, please. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what this actually seeks to do is to recognize the fact that research um, can be just about anything. Uh, you and I can sit here and do research uh, just by observation. So what I don't want to see in this language is to for people to assume that this research that um, is reflective of um, only posing critical health risks to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons um, without any kind of counseling also happens to anybody. Um, and certainly those who don't receive any kind of sexual orientation or gender identity change effort uh, counseling can suffer just as well. So this is a way of just recognizing that um, there's research that also says that there are reasons um, uh, that you don't want to be denying anyone counseling uh, because we know uh, that there are a lot of harms that can be done when that's uh, absent from somebody's uh, choice and um, ability to take advantage of. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. Um, I regret again that I have to oppose this amendment the rationale behind the amendment, I understand, and, and it is compelling to say we would like to ensure uh, that we take into consideration other health risks for other matters, but this ordinance is directly and very narrowly constructed to address the concerns of harms to LGBTQ individuals and the system that we have in place. And so I would ask my peers uh, to vote no. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also urging a no vote. And, you know, Dr. Chris Reynolds, when he spoke today, and I don't know him, but I thought uh, he was an incredible speaker, said that the organizations, the legitimate organizations that do not support conversion therapy, the list was too long that he couldn't fit it in his three minutes. American Psychological Association, American Medical Association, Academy of Pediatrics. We've got all these entities who are experts who tell us that conversion therapy is wrong. And so Ms. Kennedy's amendment is factually incorrect, and I cannot support it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, the point about it being factually incorrect uh, is actually incorrect. So um, I guess we can argue about this all day long in terms of who's done what studies and what research is out there. Um, but again, my point is that there, this isn't something, it's not just the gay, lesbian, the LGBT community that can suffer harm. And so this recognizes that, um, that there are others uh, in this challenge of trying to figure out sexual orientation or identity that need help as well. And, and there needs to be the ability to recognize that, um, that, that this, is, this is a problem. So um, I would just like to see this one in there because again, you know, you can say that, well, I think it was Mr. Constant that said that this 
is a very narrowly construed ordinance in order to address a, um, a very specific problem. And what I want to say is I don't believe that anybody is necessarily supporting conversion therapy. That is really not what is happening, but people are trying to support their right and their need for counseling uh, in these realms. And this particular ordinance is actually so broadly construed in terms of counseling and what is identified as counseling that we really are risking not addressing all of the people that could be harmed in some way by being denied access to counseling on the topic of sexuality. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot of other information to bring forward. I'll wait and see what happens with this one. Um, but um, I would really like the opportunity to explain a lot more about some of the gaps and some of the information that you have actually been given through this ordinance and for those who are testifying for it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Whittleton. Well, thanks. You know, I'll support this. And, you know, we, we do our whereas statements before particularly really important ordinance like this, we should show every consideration, the whole spectrum of what's out there. And these are the things we've looked at. These are the things we've considered. And given this package, we have chosen to go this route when you get into the meat of the ordinance. And with the whereas as are currently stated, they don't do that. They focus only narrowly on what you're going to conclude either way. And, and it didn't work for me. And that's why offered up the first pass that failed but but this fits in that same mold let's say we have looked at this thing in its breadth and we have heard in testimony that there are people who wanted um, um, gender identity change effort they wanted to change we heard that and we have read it and i found online and so it's worked for some people maybe it's a very few but it is out there and this just recognizes that you know this is a broad issue that goes every which way and you know uh, we hear that gender identity and sexual trash can is fluid, and that means it splashes every way. And if you read these whereas, it implies it only goes one way. And, and that's simply not true, and you know that, we know that. And the whereas is, I think we should take advantage, just broaden the whole presentation. And that's, that's all this does. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. Uh, so we just had the first strike of the biggest straw man of this whole process of hearing about this ordinance. And that biggest straw man is that somehow this ordinance stops people from being able to receive counseling, talk therapy of any kind, other than that specific therapy that's been found to be harmful across many spectra. It's unethical in the fields of, of the discipline of the helping fields. And so the, the biggest straw man of all of this is this argument that somehow through this ordinance, therapy is not gonna be allowed to happen. And I understand why the proponents of that argument make that argument because it scares people and fear is what rises up the energy and gets the opposition going. And so I would offer to my peers, let's see through the fear and see to the letters and go with the language that's here. It clearly does not stop anybody from receiving therapy. It's even listed the therapies that continue to be available. Talk therapy is right there among them. And so nothing in this ordinance is to be construed to stop any of those practices only the practice of attempting to convert somebody in their sexual orientation please vote no thank you miss vogel uh thank you um i just wanted to share that um given that this is uh an ordinance that i think we've heard uh you know, for, from some individuals, maybe one that's uh, subject to legal challenge. Um, I would just urge members to think of the whereas is as um, something like legislative facts and findings. So instead of um, just saying, well, you know, uh, you know, what, what doesn't matter? I feel like sometimes with our ordinances, we say, whereas is don't really matter at all. Here, um, maybe more than in, in some uh, ordinances in front of you, the whereases are the chance for the body to vote on what facts and conclusions they are, are finding to be true that um, have resulted in the ordinance. So um, what I would urge you is 
have the whereases that you want um, uh, to convey the the findings of the body. And obviously, you know, that's um, subject to your vote and your judgment. Um, but understand that those will be um, potentially pulled upon and used in litigation. And I, I presume that for different members that will um, cut different ways on how, therefore, you want to vote on these whereas clauses. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Vogel kind of beat me to the punch and more simply or less legalistically, I guess I would say, it's up to us as the policymakers to identify what research we are relying on for the purposes of the ordinance. And I, I tend to agree with Ms. Quinn Davidson when she listed off the you know, American Psychological Association amongst many others. Um, it's our judgment call as to what research we're going to rely on to make our legislative record for the ordinance. Um, and so broadening it out simply to be inclusive when um, I'm not heard or vetted the other research and it hasn't been presented um, as credible um, to me seems uh, to undercut the purpose of the ordinance and to making the intent clear. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Too many buttons over here. Um, I guess I would take issue with the comment that this was this ordinance would allow uh, the counseling that I think um, I plan to try to get at with some of my amendments, because um, Section C says very clearly it's unlawful for any provider to provide, apply, or use sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts with a patient who is a minor. So this pretty much prohibits everything and anything that has anything to do with sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts. So if there's anything that could be construed as that, somebody would then have the legal remedy of uh, finding this particular person that was providing this counseling. So I don't, I mean, I think this is exactly uh, where the crux in the road here, where we have to be able to either better define what change efforts are, or we need to better define what conversion therapy is, and we need to better define exactly what is permissible for counselors or anybody else who might be talking about this particular subject. So that is, again, kind of my motivation behind this, so that we make sure that this does not tie the hands of parents in getting their children help or counselors in doing their job. They have been it requi requested by the client to provide. So anyway, that's why we're heading down this road and having these conversations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. And if you were to continue reading the next sentence that Ms. Kennedy ended at, it states, sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts do not include counseling that does not seek to change sexual orientation or gender identity and that says the person in undergoing transition provides acceptance, support, and understanding of the person or facilitates a person's coping, social support, identity exploration and development, including sexual orientation and gender identity neutral interventions to prevent or address unlawful conduct or unsafe sexual practices. There's a broad array of practices. It's literally in the next sentence that Ms. Kennedy just, I guess, didn't get to, but it's literally there that you may continue to provide therapeutic practices other than practice that's aimed to change someone's sexual orientation. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails seven to four. Next, we have amendment number four by Assemblymember Kennedy. Is there a motion? Second. I, <laughs> did you want to make that motion, Ms. Kennedy? I'm wrestling with that. Um, 
uh, for purposes of discussion, I will move amendment number four, please. And did you want to second, Ms. Eilers? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Great. Uh, did you want to speak to it, Ms. Kennedy? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, you know, this is uh, one of those statements that I think is also uh, pretty inaccurate um, because, again, it, it makes a broad generalized statement uh, over um, some, well, this particular one about the psychological science. There are, a, there are some within the psychological or the psychology realm, if you will, uh, who would say this, but there are some who would not. And, um, and that's really kind of the question here is the idea of can we leave room for expanding the conversation uh, in that realm, if you will. Um, though I would say that homosexuality is not recognized as a disease or a physical disorder, there's certainly um, a lot of science out there that recognizes that there is a degree of mental illness and mental disorders that can be associated with someone experiencing or expressing themselves in a homosexual or transgender way. And so we don't want to so unequivocally say that um, this uh, is something that uh, all science recognizes or is universally accepted, because I think there is room for conversation out there. Hence why we have some of the conflicts that we do and we've had some of the testimony uh, that we've had. People disagree. Uh, people have different opinions. So this is just a way of making room for that kind of um, conversation and those possibilities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Allen. Thank you. At what point am I allowed to, just a little bit of guidance here, Chair, and a little leeway, uh, move to postpone only because I just got these? Um, and I would like to get some advice from um, my subject matter expert. And I'm hoping that, um, yeah, I need to go through this and find out where I stand on a lot of these. Sure. So I would suggest that once we are complete with this amendment, if you wanted to make a motion to postpone before we continue any of the further amendments, you could do so. Thank you, Chair. Seeing no further discussion on this amendment, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails seven to four. Ms. Allard? Thank you, Chair. I, I, again, I, I, maybe I misspoke. I'd like to move to postpone AO 2020-65 for further discussion um, so I can get these amendments looked at and everything throughout that we're discussing with our subject matter experts. So I, I'm moving to postpone that, please. Or move, yeah. Do you have a date uh, specific? Um, I'm looking at September 29th, please. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second by uh, Ms. Kennedy. Did you want to speak further to that motion, Ms. Allard? Yeah, I want to be, I want um, everyone to understand that I, I really respect anybody's desires or whatever they feel they want to do. That's that's not my issue here. My issue is solely based on being able as a parent to guide my child, and I don't want the government to be able to do it. These, these are my children, my religious belief. My child might have some concerns or some issues, and as a good mother, whether my child decides one way if what their sexual orientation is versus another way, I want to make sure that they have all the counseling anything that they need, and I don't want to um, judge them. I want to love them. I want to embrace them. And sometimes when a family goes through counseling, I'm speaking this as a parent because I know five people on our assembly don't have children, and they might not get the bond that we have with our kids. And I understand there's people who on the assembly that do have children, so I want to be able to get the best care for my child, and I need time to go through all of this just to make sure that we get it right. I don't believe this is our job. None of us are doctors. None of us are medical professionals. And I think this is overreaching the line of what an assembly should do. But other than that, I really want to be able to have a clear perspective of how this is going to end up. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Weddleton on the motion to postpone. Sure. Uh, Ms. Howard, so we had these emailed to us yesterday, um, I think just prior to our, um, before we hit this actually, and um, I think that amendment number 12 came to us today. Did you not get those via email? It's not enough time for me to prepare my subject matter experts on these. Okay. So uh, again, I want to make sure that what we're doing is thoughtful, as I hear that word all the time. And again, I'm going to reiterate, as a parent, I think that I deserve that time to bring in subject matter experts, to hear their advice, to know where they're coming from. Because the truth is, we did get these yesterday. But then by 4.30, I'm sitting here. That's not enough time to contact everybody and go over everything. Thank okay. you. Can I make another comment? Um, and I appreciate that. I think it is important. And, and some things don't have that critical of a deadline. And, and I think this might be in that category. We want to get it right. Um, an alternative that is, um, I think we learned, the, we did not do once and we should have when we learned the hard way, plastic bag ban, um, is we had ample, a whole bunch of amendments like we are today. And it really helps to see the final amended version before we would vote on it, you know, put it, with all the amendments put in there so we can go through it carefully. And I wonder if we could go through the amendments and then seek to postpone our decision on the entire um, item as amended instead of uh, so we can continue today but at that point pause would that work fair enough thank you john i agree to mr that. chair did i so um does the second agree to rescind okay um so then i'll go ahead and clear the queue so if i hear correctly we'll go ahead and finish up the amendments and then after that, we'll go back to a motion to postpone. So now we have amendment number five by assembly member Kennedy. Is there a motion? A point of clarification first, Mr. Chair. Is the intent just to look at the amendments, get a sense of what they're about, or is the intent to move each one and vote on each one before we postpone? That makes no sense. I would ask uh, Mr. Weddleton to clarify since he made the statement. Okay. Um, sorry if I was unclear. Uh, my preference would be to go through, as we are now, and move and vote on each amendment. Then once we get all that done, to move to postpone the decision, the vote on the full package until we see what the ordinance looks like with all the amendments in place. Um, it just gives us a clear understanding of what we've done, particularly when we've had a lot of amendments. And, and I mentioned the plastic bag ban, which we revisited two or three times, be, partly because we did not do that. We did a lot of really complicated amendments. And once we read it with everything in place, there were inconsistencies and so on. So anyway, my preference is do the vote, go through the amendments, vote on the amendments, but postpone the decision on the amended ordinance. Did I get it right to explain it all that time? Go ahead. I guess my comment to that would be then that kind of defeats the purpose that Ms. Allard was trying to get at, which was to take the time to actually look at the amendments and kind of mull those over, uh, maybe get some other uh, expertise or um, commentary on those. Um, so this is, I mean, I understand Mr. Weddleton's idea, but if there, if there is a need to wait and see what these amendments are about and figure out how you would actually want to address any of them, maybe there is a need for more time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allen? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, John, I did misunderstand. And I think um, what, what I'm trying to say is that I, I want us um, to get it right. I want to make sure we all come together and figure out how this will best work. And um, yeah, I, st I need advice on these amendments. I apologize, I probably wasn't clear in communicating that. I'd like advice on these amendments so that if I agree or don't agree, I understand where, where this legally means as well as where it medically means too. Thank you. So, thank okay. okay. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? I don't think there's a motion on the floor right now. There's not, no. So we're on the main motion unless somebody either proposes an amendment or propose, makes a motion to postpone. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to keep going here. I think we're going to have a motion in a second. Uh, Ms. Allard? Can I motion to postpone until the 29th of September? Yes. Yeah. Second. Moved and seconded by Ms. Kennedy. Can I speak to that, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. I oppose this motion to postpone. Um, if you look at the 
front page of the of the ordinance, you'll see it was introduced on June 23rd. Uh, for more than two months, we have had uh, this ordinance sort of alive on our docket. We've received many hours of public testimony, many, many emails, and we've been considering this ordinance in detail for quite some time. Um, it is... I, yesterday, I made a motion to postpone because we received an S version, sort of the last moment. Um, to, today, I intend to bring that ordinance back because I think we've had time to read through it. But the idea that a bunch of amendments could lead us to postpone an ordinance, I think, without even considering the amendments, I think is unusual. Uh, in my, my time on the Assembly, I cannot recall that ever happening. And the reason I think is pretty obvious. Uh, it would allow an opponent of, the, of an ordinance to propose a bunch of amendments which don't need any kind of public notice, which don't require any lead time, which can be done on the floor. They could propose a bunch of amendments to the point where um, the ordinance couldn't go forward. So um, I urge us to go through the amendments and pass or not pass them um, and, uh, and and do the work this body usually does. So I oppose this particular motion to postpone. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm certainly fully prepared to continue to go through my amendments, but I will say that I know that this topic is controversial and I know that there are a lot of emotions running very high about this and my my intent is not to offend but I'm pretty sure somebody at some point is going to say oh I'm offended <laughs> and I will just go on and say okay that's fine I won't take notice of any of the name calling that I get called but um, I will definitely um, I would definitely agree that this is such a um, sensitive issue. It, it obviously gets to the heart of a lot of people. And I certainly wouldn't in any way, shape, or form want to rush it. Now that we've actually had the public testimony, we've had the document for a couple of months. There was a work session. And now people are starting to talk about it. People are sharing their stories. Um, they're, they've been powerful. And since we've had that opportunity to actually hear those stories, we ought to be hopefully crafting a piece of legislation that is better suited to what works for our community. And that is my point in all of this, is to make sure that, um, that we don't do something that, um, that basically disables one part of the community while enabling another part of the community. So I think this is, it's, it's fair to say that maybe we need some time to sit on this a little bit. Um, I don't think it's gonna change the uh, process in terms of we won't have more public process or more public uh, input. Well, maybe people could still email us, but we've closed public hearing. And for me, now it is kind of a time to kind of digest some of this. And I don't want any of this to be reactive. I want it to be thoughtful. So I think if we have the opportunity to really look at this, and now we have amendments, you know, people can actually look at these and try to figure out where some of these amendments are coming from. Um, so anyway, I would love to postpone this. I think it's probably a wise thing to do something that will actually help us to come up with a better product. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Atwood. I just wanted to also reiterate, we have 11 amendments here. And it, like Ms. Kennedy said, it's a lot to digest. And I'm willing to compromise if we could just postpone until the 15th of September. That's fine. I seriously just want to be able to understand and read all this and just come together as a team and do, we all do the right thing and we can work together. But I just need some time. Thank you. Thank you. Does the, just going off of what Ms. Allard just stated, does the second agree to change the motion to September 15th? Yes. Okay. So that'll be the updated motion in front of us, a motion to postpone to September 15th. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson? No. Mr. Perez Verdia? No. That motion fails eight to three.
So going back, um, is there a motion on amendment number five? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the idea behind this amendment to add the language abusive, inappropriate, <laughs> wanted, sexual orientation, and gender identity change efforts uh, is just an effort to, uh, to try to uh, specify or identi identify um, some of the um, potential uh, unwanted treatments that could be sought out just or that would not be sought out, sorry. And um, uh, just to make sure that it, this would try to get more to the heart of what I think is intended in this ordinance um, and would absolutely be more um, prescriptive. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Allard? Um, I have somebody that I'd like to try to recommend it, if that's possible, please. Sure. Michael. Hi, Mike. This is um, Mrs. Allard here on the assembly. I, I would like to know, have you received um, amendment number five that the uh, that I just emailed to you? I received uh, two amendments. Do you have number in five one, in front of you? In one email. Hold on. Let me check real fast and see if it's here yet. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, here. Okay, good. Inbox. Okay. And after you find uh, the amendment, sir, if you could just for the record identify yourself, please. Oh, certainly. Uh, I do not see the uh, amendment. I have amendment C through 12 and SA. I have two. I have two PDFs that were sent to me. My name is Michael Pankin. Michael. Uh, Miss Allard, I'm okay with taking a, a short break so okay. you can email it. Yeah. To yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mike, this is Jamie again. So okay. if, if you look at the email that was sent to you, yeah, there's the first attachment, and it's amendments 1 through 11. Can you click on that first attachment? Okay, I can click on that one. I have it. Okay, and if you scroll, it'll go 1 through 11. Can you give us your comments on amendment number 5, please? Amendment number 5. And uh, I guess with that, we're go we'll go ahead and end our break. Um, so we can get back to business. So go ahead. Number two, number three, number four, number five.
Okay, so it looks like amendment number five is going, is looking at the fourth whereas, line number four. Yes. I believe it. It says page one, and then it's at line number 11, please. Correct. Okay, I've read through the amendment. What is the question? I just want to know, like, when you're reading that amendment, where do you stand on the change for at line 11? Versus what the proposed summary of the amendment is. I like the wording of the amendment. Does it deviate so much from the proposed or the purpose of the summary of the amendment? I think that's more in spirit. Yes, correct. Okay. Will you stay on the line for the other amendments when I have questions, please? Yes, yes ma'am. I'll be here. Okay, thank you. I have another question for you, sir. Mr. Constant, thank you. I didn't catch your last name. Could you say it really clearly? And also, would you establish for us your expertise? Certainly. My last name is Pankin. My expertise is that uh, I have experience in teaching fundamentals of law and politics. I've also taught U.S. Constitution and Alaskan Constitution. Worked for a major insurance company here in Anchorage for over five years, dealing with liability issues and legal ramifications of being of clients being sued and gone back and forth with those issues. I'm a mature individual, uh, reasonable. Thank you. So I just would ask, do you have expertise in psychological, psychiatric, medical, or any other counseling field? Not in the counseling field, no. Injury field, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allen? Um, in that case, if, if it would be better suited for Mr. Constant, I will go ahead and call that individual that has all that expertise and get him on the line instead. This feels dilatory, Mr. Chair, but I guess we'll entertain it. So, could you call Mr. Peter Spriggs? And then, um, so, Ms. Hallard, is this going to be the individual that you'll rely on for all of the... Thank you. That would be helpful. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please... Con Mr. Chair, quick point of order. Yes, Mr. Constant. I, if, if we're going to do dueling uh, experts, it may be that we need to keep calling back and forth because we all have people who could testify with expertise on the topics. Yes, I, I believe Ms. Allard, though, had a question on this amendment for who you're, yeah. So, uh, yeah, what, what we'll likely have to do is just keep calling back and forth. <laughs> Slightly inefficient, but that's okay. And Ms. Allard, did you email these amendments to Mr. Spritz? Hello, uh, this is Peter Sprig. I just realized it. Go ahead and skip five, and then I'll email these to Mr. Spriggs, and then go. we can go from there. Okay. Uh, hi, Mr. Spriggs. This is Felix Rivera with the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, we're just going to keep you on the line if there are questions for you regarding some of the amendments that we are deliberating. Uh, you're going to get these amendments any second now in an email from uh, Jamie Allen. All right, thank you. Uh, so with that, is there any further discussion on Amendment Number 5? Mr. Constant? Thank you. Um, the intent here may be um, in good faith, but the effect is that it essentially asserts that there are some sexual orientation, gender identity change efforts that are, in fact, not inappropriate. And I think that for the members, I would ask for a no vote because, in fact, there are no. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All the more reason for us to be looking at this in this way because Mr. Constant was assuring me that there was nothing in here that said a parent couldn't seek some kind of counseling for their, for their child. 
uh, in terms of their sexual identity and potential transgender issues. So um, that's kind of uh, doesn't make sense to me uh, that that would be that contradictory. So my point in doing this would be to say that this would have to be some kind of identifiable, inappropriate treatment. Uh, that's kind of the point that I'm really trying to get at in all of this, is how do we identify that? What is that? What does that look like? And how do parents still have the ability to seek the help that their child is asking for? And that's, to me, that's the million dollar question in all of this. So that's why I'm trying to put some language in there that will be descriptive enough that will allow people to seek the kind of help that they are asking for, that they are wanting. Uh, be, uh, so anyway, that's the importance of this particular uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alitel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's important to remember that we keep these amendments in the context of the entire ordinance. And what the, enti the way the ordinance describes um, the prohibition on gender identity change efforts is that it is abusive, inappropriate, and unwanted. So to put a qualifier on it does exactly what Mr. Constant said. So we have to keep these in the context of what the entire ordinance is intent um, and other provisions say. This would create an internal contradiction within the ordinance um, that would undercut its entire intent. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. After all the testimony we've heard from experts, and I mean medical and counseling experts who practice in these fields, that sexual orientation and gender change, identity change efforts are harmful, why would we want to qualify that? The reason that the member is attempting to qualify that is to be able to still engage in some of those activities that are harmful. So I'm a solid no vote, and I urge my colleagues to join me. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I think we have to reiterate the fact that some people disagree with that. Some people say that change efforts have not only been successful, but they have been requested. And that's the, that's the part of this that we can't ignore. And that's what concerns me about this idea that, uh, just like the statement was made, that there are no appropriate sexual orientation and gender identity change efforts. They're all inappropriate. And the point is, we know that there are people who are arguing that because they have been through it and they have it's been successful to them. So how do we, do we just ignore those people? I mean, that's really the, the, the question in all of this, is how do we get to the bottom of what is considered inappropriate and what would be appropriate and if we don't have better language and descriptors in this, people will go on and somebody will say, well, that was appropriate. I, I liked that. That was what I asked for. And somebody else will say, uh, from the same counselor, will say, oh, that was abusive. I'm going to bring a charge against that person. So um, this is where all this gets muddied and confusing. And what I'm really trying to do, again, is make sure that we have something that is balanced and really allows people to have access, minors even, specifically, obviously, but that they would have access to the kinds of counseling that they're requesting. They don't want the abusive, inappropriate, and unwanted stuff. So it makes, sure, you know, it makes sense to me that we would be able to quantify that with this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on amendment number five. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails seven to four. Next, we have amendment number six by Assemblymember Kennedy. Is there a motion? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me catch up here just a second. Um, uh, this was in, this one is in regard to um, deleting uh, current language. Um, let's see. Whereas no other means of protecting minors from the harms associated with such efforts would be affected would be deleted because it, it really isn't true. There are multiple laws and statutes regard to, in regard to child abuse that are um, on the books in this state. So there, uh, there are also multiple agencies by which anybody could uh, uh, report this abuse. And there would be not only fines, but investigations and potential criminal ac um, action. 
uh, against those people perpetrating this improper behavior. So I think we're well covered in that. Um, I don't know that we need to add something uh, to what is already there that protects a child from child abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'd support this, too. And, and we got an email from Kate Shortell, who um, spoke yesterday evening, I think, in our work session as well, and is very well versed on this. I think if there's a subject matter expert, she's got to be there. And in her email, she said that conversion therapy is arguably child abuse as defined under Alaska Statute 4717-290. Uh, she goes on to describe what child abuse could be. Um, and she says, State of Alaska has a public policy of child protection, and the people covered under AO 202065 are also those defined to be mandatory reporters under state statute. Qualified expert witness who is a pediatrician and her child psychologist can render a diagnosis of a child abuse, such an expert. Well, they said we could call one. but um, So there is clearly in this that um, what we're doing is somewhat redundant with what's in state law already. Thank you. Ms. so and Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe this amendment is built on a false premise, which is how laws are implemented. Um, this, you know, the laws that Ms. Kennedy talked about are responsive to acts after the harm has already occurred. Um, the mandatory reporter is to report acts of child abuse. This is um, a preventative measure to prevent the acts or the harmful acts from occurring. Um, and setting the professional standard that it will not occur in the municipality. So I think there's a fundamental difference um, between uh, what Ms. Kennedy is uh, offering as some protections um, and this. This will enhance the protections for these uh, children and youth. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Yeah, to make another highly legalistic point, sort of similar to what Ms. Zalatel said. So to John's point about there being a state law that perhaps protects them, for the purposes of judicial review, um, if another, how do I say it, if there's a federal law against something, it doesn't obviate a state's need to pass a similar law if they so choose, um, because you can't rely on that other sovereign to, to have that law. So if that state law went into effect, we'd want our own law, too. And I, th I think Ms. Zalatel is correct. These are there's enough distinction that, that it, it doesn't matter. But even if they were identical, um, the existence of a state law does not update the need of a statement like this um, were it to be challenged in our own law. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Atwood. Yeah, if we can call Mr. Spriggs. Is he still on the line with us? Yeah, he's still on the line. Go ahead, Ms. Atwood. Mr. Spriggs, did you, were you, did you have a moment to look at the amendment? Well, I received, um, I received Amendment 1 and Amendment 12. I don't see any of the, any other amendments unless they're on the same. Uh, Mr. Spriggs, uh, so yes. Amendment 1 is a package of, of, of Amendments 1 through 10 or 11. Um, so if you open up that first one and then scroll down, you'll see 1, 2, 3, and then you'll get to 6 eventually. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, so I'm still a little behind you here. <laughs> and could you um, um, also, just for the assembly, Mr. Spriggs, can you introduce yourself and your background, please? Yes. Um, uh, my name is Peter Sprigg. Uh, I'm a senior fellow for policy studies at Family Research Council in Washington, D.C., and um, I uh, have been doing research writing and uh, media commentary on uh, these issues of human sexuality for 19 years with Family Research Council. Thank you. And then if you can give me a comment um, as I'm trying to figure out these amendments and where we stand with it all, and I would like your advice and your testimony, please. Um, okay. Uh, you, are you discussing Amendment 6 now? Is that correct? Correct. Um, Well, one, one comment I would make is that um, uh, most of the, uh, usually when uh, criticisms are made of sexual orientation change efforts or gender identity change efforts or so-called conversion therapy, um, the uh, arguments are raised regarding um, 
abusive methods uh, such as so-called aversion therapy where there is uh, some kind of physical discomfort applied to create a, a negative stimulus associated with the sexual orientation, for example. And yet those are methods that um, were used back in the 1960s and 70s and are virtually never used by, uh, by anyone anywhere today. And so if the concern is regarding these type of abusive practices, then uh, it would seem uh, that the language, should, the language of the legislation should be narrowly tailored uh, to address those abusive practices and not uh, to target ordinary talk therapy, uh, which is um, where a, a client voluntarily undertakes a discussion about the client's own chosen goal um, and uh, the, the oh, therapist uh, client achieved that goal. Sir. Does that answer your question, Ms. Allen? Yeah, this is exactly why I needed time to be able to speak in regards to these and postpone these amendments. Point of order. I'm just trying to understand what the testimony about the nature of the last 60 years or 40 years of conversion therapy has to do with line 21, page 1. We're on line 21, page 1, and I would really be hopeful that we could laser in on the discussions that we're trying to have as opposed to having these broad general discussions, which we can have after the amendments. Here's the thing. So last night, I wanted him to be able to chime in to testify. He couldn't because we were listening to everybody else. I needed time to get my expert witness so I can hear what's going on. He cannot come physically in the chamber. So to sit here and just pound me because I'm trying to understand what's going forward is absolutely absurd. And if you can't understand that and respect it, maybe you need to step back. So, Sally, did you have a specific question regarding amendment number six for Mr. Sprick? Mr. Sprague, so I have Amendment 6 sitting in front of me. If you look at the proposed summary of amendments, you'll see under proposed amendment that block is currently in there. Then if you look below, it will say the text of the amendment. Can you give me an opinion if you would approve or disapprove this amendment based on the fact that I only have two choices? And can you explain why you would, if you had to, take the worst case scenario and approve this amendment, please? Um, so the amendment uh, number six is to strike the whereas statement that says whereas no other means of protecting minors uh, from the harms associated with such efforts would be effective. Is that correct? Yes. Um, well, I, I would agree with the statement that there, um, I, I, I would agree that that particular whereas statement is false because there are other means of protecting uh, minors from the alleged harms. Um, but uh, I would say that simply striking that, um, striking that passage would not, make the, uh, would not make the legislation acceptable in my eyes uh, Spriggs, since it still imposes restrictions. Mr. Spriggs, that's not the question that we have before us. The question that we have before us is regarding amendment number six. So uh, just, um, a, a, I'll, I'll just leave you on hold for a actually, while. Actually, Ms. Allard, I, I'm speaking. So uh, on this amendment, um, would you, just to get to Ms. Allard's questions, it sounds like you would uh, approve this amendment. Is that a correct assumption? If I'm understanding the amendment correctly, I would, I would approve the amendment, but it would not be sufficient for me to vote in favor of the legislation. Got it. Thank you. Thank well, you. That's not the question that we have, but thank you. Uh, Mr. Constant? The argument was made that we have state law that addresses child abuse. The argument was made that we have all these other laws that do that. The argument was even made that these practices haven't happened since the 60s and the 70s, but we heard testimony from people who are just barely in their 20s who have experienced these types of abusive practices. And so I would offer that the whole reason we are here having this conversation is because the state has failed to protect these children. So I would offer that this amendment should be voted no. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, there, well, actually, can I ask Mr. Sprigg a question myself? Sure. So, thank you. Mr. Sprigg, this is Assemblymember Crystal Kennedy. And uh, in regard to the idea of there being no other ways to protect minors other than other than through this particular piece of legislation, uh, 
I do believe is a false statement. That's why I'm suggesting that we delete it. But could you expand a little bit um, on what other safeguards are in place for how counseling is done? You may not be specifically familiar with um, our counseling licensing requirements in the state of Alaska, but can you speak from a general perspective about what kind of protections there are for minors when they're dealing with a counselor? Uh, well, one uh, one issue is the question of uh, appropriate jurisdiction, and I'm not aware uh, before this issue came to the fore uh, of uh, sexual orientation change efforts, uh, I'm not aware of any instance in which uh, the mental health profession or any uh, medical profession or health profession has been regulated at the local level by municipal governments. This is generally uh, the question of licensing and the practices of licensed professionals generally is something that rests at the state level. So uh, I'm, I'm if there's another means of uh, protecting minors, it would be uh, at the state level rather than at the municipal level. Um, but secondly, I think that um, uh, the process of informed consent uh, is a much less intrusive uh, method of protect, generally protecting the interests of clients by um, requiring that they be provided with uh, factual information about the proposed treatment uh, and be allowed to make a personal decision themselves or together with their parents whether this is a, um, a treatment that they wish to undertake. Uh, ironically, the uh, 2009 American Psychological Association Task Force Report, which is often cited in support of uh, this type of legislation actually uh, did not call for legislative bans upon the therapy, uh, even though it was it was critical of this type of therapy. But it did suggest implementing a um, a system of informed consent, and uh, so I think I would say that would be another means of protecting minors from the harms that are sometimes alleged. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. On amendment number six. Mr. Peterson. No. Mr. Peterson. No. Mr. Michael's absent. I'm going to move on. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Um, I could hear Pete, and he was saying no, so you might want to try again or maybe have him call back in or something. But anyway, I'm voting no as well. Mr. Perez Verdia? No. Can I go back to Pete? Mr. Peterson? No. Thank you. I could hear you that tonight. That amendment fails nine to two. Next, we have amendment number seven by Assemblymember Kennedy. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this amendment very simply changes uh, just one word from liberally to justifiably. And the idea behind this is that just the word liberally can certainly be can mean anything, just any reason at all uh, that would be able to enact or enforce this regulation and obviously the penalties um, that are remedies for violation of this ordinance. Um, we need to have something that ha gives somebody an, an actual justifiable rationale for claiming that they have been harmed in some way. Um, I think it's just kind of dangerous to have something that's just what I, what I would call kind of an anything goes law, where anybody can just arbitrarily say, oh, yes, I'm offended by that, and now I've been hurt, so now I have the uh, ability to sue you in uh, some kind of civil court, and you'll be fine. And anyway, so um, I think the idea of changing the word to justifiably means that there should probably be some kind of standards. There should be some kind of set of criteria by which somebody could make that judgment in terms of saying that they were harmed 
something that could be um, uh, tangible or related, and um, then they would have the recourse to um, seek some kind of judgment or fine on that individual. So I think this is makes sense. I can't imagine that we would have laws that are just anything goes and uh, so i don't think this should be an exception thank you thank you Ms. Cliff davidson thanks mr chair um i would urge a no vote um as an attorney i think that what uh, miss pick and by the way uh, it's casey is a female so i saw a lot of folks referring to her as a him um but she i think really spelled it out well in the memo and it's a standard statutory interpretation tool that we use the term liberally construed with civil rights and anti-discrimination legislation. And so this is a, a term of art and completely appropriate legally. And I don't really quite understand what Ms. Kennedy's trying to do, but she's trying to create a new legal standard uh, that is inappropriate. So I would urge a no vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zalotel? Um, I'll let Ms. Vogel go first. Ms. Vogel? Uh, thank you. I think I was going to say something similar to what um, Assemblymember Quinn Davidson had to say, which is that um, liberally construed has a particular meaning in the law, um, but I, I don't know what justifiably construed would mean. And, um, you know, you uh, if, if someone didn't want it to say liberally construed, sort of removing that language saying liberally construed to me would be a, a legally superior option to in, to creating the term justifiably construed because I don't know how to interpret that term or, or use it in a legal um, uh, setting. Thank you. Ms. Alita. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just wanted to add on to the point Ms. Vogel made and that Ms. Quinn Davidson made is that these aren't anything, those types of laws. If um, there's enforcement, then there will be whatever appropriate forum and rules. And it's very much like every other law that we have. It's not anything goes. You have to make a colorable claim or if it's complaint driven, the complaint has to be based um, often that you have to swear out that you believe that those complaint is based on facts and that it's truthful. So, um, I think that the, we have to, again, consider the amendment in the context of the ordinance and the processes at play um, as to how the um, ordinance of pass will, will roll out. Um, and so I'm okay that um, liberally construed actually does have parameters on it, and it's the um, rules by which we um, work through uh, legal disputes um, and enforcement actions. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? All right, thanks. Uh, to hit on this a little bit more, so Ms. Vogel, if um, it just were, if liberally were taken out and not replaced, so it, what would be the difference between that and liberally construed? I want the technical legal description in layman's terms. Through the chair, Assemblymember Weddleton, um, Okay, so liberally construed convey, conveys, uh, here's our intent, uh, court, um, uh, understand that this is our intent and interpret it in a way to help us achieve this aim. Just having the word construed, um, it, it wouldn't have quite that same meaning. Uh, you know, it, 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 would, it would still be indicating the intent, but not, um, not giving it that uh degree of you know liberal construction is a thing so just saying construed still conveys some meaning along that direction but not um, same um and i'm sorry that that maybe doesn't sound quite as technical as what you were asking for can i follow up briefly sure so it, it, would the legal processes that miss Zolotel described still apply no matter if liberally we're in there compared to uh, not uh, compared with it being deleted. Um, so through the chair, I, I think liberally construed was chosen um, specifically um, looking at other laws because it is a way to allow the law to more easily easily survive judicial scrutiny. So it's 
it, it is a provision that's put in here to allow it to survive legal challenge more easily. And that's why the words are there. If you remove it, you've removed that, that aid in a legal challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, to remind the members, even though Mr. Gates is not in the room, I think he is also available for questions if you have any questions for him on the phone. Uh, Ms. Allard? Thank you. Uh, yes, I was speaking to Ms. G Mr. Gates just now. So can we then just strike the entire last sentence on Ms. that? Sorry, who's that question directed towards? Uh, Mrs. Kennedy. So the amendment in front of us says justifiably. So I guess I'd like to take another approach and delete the whole sentence because I believe based on what um, Mr. Gates has said that it's just an unnecessary sentence. Would you be open to that? Uh, I will second that if that's a motion. But that's a motion. It would be an amendment to the amendment. Uh, that isn't a question for Mr. Gates. So, uh, so can you restate uh, your amendment to the amendment, please? Right. So from the advice from Mr. Gates, I would like to re just delete the whole sentence It's because it's unnecessary. That's his advice. Can you read the sentence you seek to delete? Uh, I believe it would start at, and its provision shall be liberally construed to accomplish this person's purpose. And Ms. Kennedy, was that a second to that amendment to the amendment? Yes, thank you. And um, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, Mr. Gates, are you on the phone? Mr. Gates? So he was having trouble unmuting himself last time. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's the thing. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break.
start it again.
no problem. All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, before we get back to this amendment to the amendment, um, one, I would uh, request at this time a motion to extend debate by one hour and 45 minutes. So moved. Which Second. would take us to 9.30 for debate. So moved and seconded by Ms. Salito. Is there any opposition? Okay, uh, hearing none, then debate is extended until 9.30 on this item. Um, so now we have this amendment to the amendment before us. Um, Mr. Gates, if you can go ahead and uh, speak to this, and then I'll go back to Ms. Allard. Um, yes, I'll try. So if I understand the question to me is, um, this was using the word liberally construed yeah, and, in amendment number and, and I'll just be a little bit more uh, specific on, so this amendment to the amendment that we have before us, strike uh, the words in amendment number seven, and its provisions shall be justifiably construed to accomplish this purpose. So to strike that entire phrase. And uh, my understanding from um, the sponsor of this mm -hmm. mover of this amendment to the amendment was... Um, that this was uh, based on advice from council. So we just wanted to make sure everyone got that same advice. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So striking that phrase here, it's a phrase that is used often in legislation, and it helps the court understand that the legislative body intended to accomplish this purpose and to interpret it to really accomplish that purpose when we've got some gray areas and so forth. But taking it out doesn't really diminish that. Taking it out just means that the court's going to look at plain language and interpret it based on what's in front of them. And if there's a gray area, they will make a decision based on um, precedent, law, public policy, things like that. And um, I invite Ms. Quintani to add as well. But the, the phrase here doesn't really diminish the whole intent of the ordinance and the prohibition on uh, conversion therapy that the ordinance will do by its own express terms. It would probably just uh, assist the court um, in applying it to certain situations where it might be ambiguous. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. Mr. Perez Verdia. That amendment to the amendment fails seven to three. We now have the main amendment before us. Any further discussion? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move another amendment to the amendment, and that would be to change the word justifiably to narrowly. So I would agree its provision shall be narrowly construed to accomplish this purpose. Is there a second? Second. You didn't second it. Did you want to speak to that, Ms. Kennedy? You know, maybe this is a, a better terminology just in terms of trying to get to the fact that we have to make sure that this isn't uh, a law that would be easily abused uh, within the counseling community or even within anybody who, gosh, you know, I, th I think about our school nurses, our health teachers, uh, all the people who could potentially end up in a situation where they could be, it could be misconstrued that they were acting in a, because they're all licensed in some way or another, but if they were uh, construed as uh, saying something hurtful, uh, then they would be uh, subject to this kind of litigation. And so if we make sure that it's something that is carefully, as in narrowly construed, then we provide some uh, protections against this just turning into a giant litigation tool. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vogel. Um, 
Thank you. I just want to say narrowly construed is a term that courts uh, do know how to use. So um, I think it would um, be uh, an interpretive tool uh, uh, that a court would know what to do with, and it would be on the exact opposite side of the scale as liberally construed. So um, I think that that is a way of achieving uh, the goal that you have articulated. Thank you. Mr. Dumba. Thank you. For exactly that reason, I oppose this amendment. It would place a, a bar that I believe is too high for the private action for the people seeking their uh, to assert their rights under this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on this amendment to the amendment. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment to the amendment fails eight to three. We now have the main amendment before us. Any further discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. And this is on amendment number seven. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails nine to two. Next, we have amendment number seven. Uh, excuse me, eight by assembly. Is there a motion? A move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me get to the right document here. Okay, um, this basically uh, totally replaces the language under findings and intent to better reflect um, uh, better truth, I guess I would, would might say about that. Um, and just in reading some of it, you know, some medical and mental health experts have denounced efforts to change sexual orientation and gender identity as ineffective and unsafe. unsafe. That's true. But there's also personal testimony of those who have successfully changed uh, and that's one thing that has to be recognized. So currently there are no conclusive studies that confirm that sexual orientation change efforts are effective or are not effective. Um, and there is anecdotal and personal testimony to support both results. Um, so regardless, the assembly finds that any kind of unethical, abusive, or coerced treatment is likely to do serious harm to any heterosexual, homosexual, or trans, trans transgender person and in order to protect the health and well-being of a minor should be prohibited. So this is a, a way of basically taking all of the issues, kind of goes back to what I was trying to express at the beginning, that um, there is certainly potential for um, a variety of people to be hurt in some kind of counseling situation regarding sexuality. And what we want to do is acknowledge that and basically write a law that will protect all of them as they undergo any kind of counseling um, and treatment therapy. Um, and if you'll indulge me a bit, um, Mr. Chair, um, and I'm sorry, I need to take this off, Mr. Constant, if you need to move further back, I understand. <laughs> um, one of the things that is um, very interesting about some of the information that I've really been delving into over this ordinance uh, is some of the things that have not been said. Uh, there's an awful lot in this ordinance that uh, you can say is um, uh, common uh, information. But what was interesting to me was the kind of information that was actually left out. And uh, in researching, uh, just very simply, uh, probably one of the foremost um, speakers on this particular issue, the, um, uh, the, the Association or the American um, Psychological Association, 
they have an entire um, page devoted to their policy on sexual orientation. And there are some very interesting statements in there that really caused me to take a second look at what we were trying to do here. And in an effort to make this as well-rounded and supportive of what I think is the original intent of the ordinance, but to also protect those who also have an interest in this as well. But one of the statements from the um, APA is that um, sexual orientation change efforts has been controversial due to tensions between the values held by some faith-based organizations on the one hand and those held by lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights organizations and professional and scientific organizations on the other hand. Psychology as a science and various faith traditions as theological systems can acknowledge and respect their profoundly different methodological and philosophical viewpoints. I think that's important to remember. And I think, and I really um, credit this organization for acknowledging that. But it goes on to say there are no studies of adequate scientific rigor to conclude whether or not recent uh, sexual orientation change efforts do or do not work to change a person's sexual orientation. So therefore, there's a lot of room for question, and there's certainly a lot of room for uh, opinion, and that's why we've gotten the opinion from people who say it does work. Although sound uh, data on the safety of um, SOCE are extremely limited, some individuals reported being harmed. We acknowledge that. So obviously that is where this uh, ordinance uh, it comes from uh, and is trying to address. But it also says, although there is insufficient evidence to support the use of psychological interventions to change sexual orientation, some individuals have modified their sexual orientation, identity, behavior, and values. So even this organization recognizes that it does happen. They recognize there are no, st there are no defined uh, adequate uh, scientific um, studies, but that obviously they're at least acknowledging that there are some um, there's some room for question and some room for conversation. Uh, one of the things that uh, they do have is a resolution that actually speaks to specifically the task force findings that, uh, that they had uh, engaged to come up with this policy. And it says, on the basis of the task force findings, the APA encourages mental health professionals to provide assistance to those who seek sexual orientation change by utilizing affirmative multicultural competent and client-centered approaches. So they're not saying that sexual change um, efforts are bad. They're not even saying you should never do them. They're actually advocating, well, they're certainly not advocating for denying their clients seeking uh, any kind of change effort counseling. So in the resolution, it says, and and I really appreciated a lot of this, but it says, whereas the American Psychological Association expressly opposes prejudice and discrimination based on age, gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, culture, national or origin, religion, sexual orientation, disability, language, or socioeconomic status. And they go on to say, whereas psychologists respect human diversity, including age, gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, culture, national origin, religion, and sexual orientation, disability, language, and socioeconomic status. So they value and they recognize that all of these components play a role in how they would have address any of their um, treatments or how they would even expect any of their psychologists um, to, um, to, to deliver these treatments. Um, one of the most amazing things I think that they put in here, though, um, uh, let's see, no, that's not one. Oh. So in their be it resolved part, they said, be it further resolved that the American Psychological Association opposes the distortion and selective use of scientific data about homosexuality by individuals and organizations seeking to influence public policy and public opinion. Uh, be it further resolved that the American Psychological Association, and this is my favorite part, 
encourages advocacy groups, elected officials, mental health professionals, policymakers, religious professionals, and organizations, and other organizations to seek areas of collaboration that may promote the well-being of sexual minorities. And I really appreciated the fact that they've taken that statement, that's their last statement in their resolution, and they went so far as to actually found a, uh, a group that they've called uh, Reconciliation and Growth. And the interesting thing about this is kind of the makeup of this group. Their authors, the um, authors of their particular Reconciliation and Growth um, effort is basically um, they're a group of mental health professionals and academics who represent a wide spectrum of faith-based and ideological positions. The diverse competition, composition of this group attests to the ability to engage in collaborative dialogue. For example, several members of our group have been recipients of therapeutic efforts and or activities to bring about changes to their sexual orientation. Some believe harm was done to them, which we've been talking about, because of those interventions. Others of our group report positive outcomes from their experiences with these interventions. Some members of our group have provided therapy to help individuals experience shifts in sexual orientation. Some members of our group have been opponents of such therapy. And they also went on to say the current governance of therapies addressing sexual orientation and non-traditional gender is vague and polarized. Therefore, we seek to define a set of standards and practices that are ethical and fair. And that is really the effort that they're working on right now, is to try to figure out how to balance cultural and religious needs with those of the scientific community. And there's been an awful lot of stuff that's really just started to come out recently that is actually, you know, might have been taken for granted a year ago, but has been recently rescinded. So my, my point in all of this and my point in bringing forth all of these amendments is to have a conversation where we can do the kinds of things that will work for the particular group that feels like they're, um, they're being harmed, while at the same time allow for those who disagree and actually seek this kind of, or any kind of counseling on, on this level of sexual orientation or just human sexuality, if you will. So that leads me then to the fact that, like I said, with this particular amendment, the effort behind this is not to deny the harms that people believe have happened to them because, I mean, that's their opinion. That If that's how they feel, that's how they feel. But we also have to recognize that there are others who are being helped and we don't want to limit that capability. We don't want to let pe make people think that they, they can't help somebody in, this situ in, in these situations with their struggle or challenges with their um, sexual orientation or gender identity. So I know that was a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but I hope you'll understand a little bit more about really what's going on in this question. Uh, and how we really need to be careful about how we uh, move forward with this. If we need more conversation, I was actually, you know, one thing that I hate about the, the fact that we can't talk to more people is we couldn't really sit down and talk about this kind of stuff till tonight. And so, therefore, that's why you see the amendments. They're basically doorways to try to figure out how we best approach this particular ordinance so that it works for everybody. Because one thing that I think is really important is if, you can so easily make bad policy. And good policy means we do the most good for the most people for the longest amount of time. And if we're not doing that here tonight, then this is not a good piece of, of, of policy. So I hope that this could be supported and maybe we can try to figure out a little bit better even uh, of how to improve this ordinance so that it really does address all the things that need to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Allen. Thank you, Chair. Can I please ask Peter's opinion on this amendment? Sure. Thank you. Peter, are you on the line? Here. Can you go ahead and um, speak on amendment number eight, please? Yes, uh, I think that the uh, I think that Assembly Member Kennedy has. Uh, expressed the argument in favor of it very well, and I agree with uh, everything that she said. Um, <clears throat> I think that the proposed amendment is much more 
uh, factually accurate in describing the, the situation with respect to the evidence uh, on sexual orientation and gender identity change efforts than the previous language was. Um, it is true that there is anecdotal evidence, uh, both uh, arguing that, that this is harmful to some individuals and anecdotal evidence uh, that it was successful and not harmful to other individuals. And it's also true that, the, um, uh, that there are no conclusive studies in the sense that the uh, quality of the studies that have been done, there have been studies done, but the quality has not risen to the level uh, where we can say that there is scientific proof um, of, of either uh, either assertion, either positive or negative assertions about this type of therapy. Um, one comment I would make that is uh, that that I, I did not hear Assemblymember Kennedy say was uh, in the previous language that this amendment would strike. It says these efforts are based on the discredited premise that being non-heterosexual or transgender is a mental disorder that can be corrected or cured. Um, strictly speaking, that's not true, that that is the premise of these efforts. Instead, these efforts are based on the undeniable premise that some people experience uh, their same-sex attractions or their gender dysphoria or gender incongruity as something that is not desired by them, as something that is unwanted. And that is all that is uh, necessary uh, for uh, to justify um, them seeking uh, professional help uh, to achieve their own personal goals on this type of issue. Um, so it's, it's not premised on it. It doesn't have to be premised on it being uh, a, a formally diagnosable mental disorder. Many people seek um, professional psychological help or counseling for issues which are not diagnosable mental disorders. And the most commonly, um, some very common examples would be grief over the loss of a loved one. It is not a mental disorder to grieve the loss of a loved one, but it is something for which people often will seek uh, counseling or help. Um, and also uh, marital difficulties, uh, uh, challenges within one's marriage. Uh, th it's not a mental illness to have challenges in your marriage, but it is an issue with which, uh, for which people often seek professional help. So um, I, I, I think that the text of this amendment is, is much more factual and accurate than the previous text, and I, I would urge the Assembly to support it. Thank you, Mike. Peter. Thank you. Ms. Alito. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate learning more from, about where Ms. Kennedy's coming from, but I'm unpersuaded because while the information she read really talked about the potential efficacy of uh, change efforts, um, it still doesn't discount the harm this ordinance is intended to prevent. Um, and harm to youth and children. Um, so I, I think, um, again, I appreciate learning more from her point of view, but um, I think we need to be clear that the intent of the ordinance is to prevent harm, um, and this language suggests that there may not be harm from these um, efforts, and um, I, I just find that untrue and not supported by uh, the research that um, or we've been presented with um, and or the testimony um, we've received um, from those who um, testified about the harms that they suffered uh, when they were subjected to these types of change efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant. I'll just briefly state also that it was suggested in this conversation that uh, there was some intersection or liaison between faith and science and that there's conflict there. And we have carefully crafted this ordinance to protect religious liberty. And so there, and this ordinance does not uh, create a conflict therein. So I urge no. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the members may proceed to vote on amendment number eight. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails eight to three. 
Next, we have amendment number nine by Assemblymember Kennedy. Is there a motion? Uh, move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this one um, is in regard to, again, trying to spell out that there are certain uh, sexual orientation and gender identity change efforts that could be wanted that we know people have requested and people have been have considered successful. So this would be a prohibition on uh, anything that would be considered unethical, unorthodox, abusive, and, and I don't even care if anybody amends those words. Uh, the same with the last line on there, the idea of um, basically not allowing any kind of form of physical, medicinal, surgical, injectable, constraining, or coercive tactic. I mean, there's probably more um, uh, qualifiers and quantifiers that could be added to that. So um, I think it's probably otherwise pretty self-explanatory. So to make sure that we're just uh, really uh, highlighting the potential tangible harms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Allen? Thank you. I would like to ask Peter to go ahead and speak on amendment number 10, please. I'm sorry, do you mean amendment number 9? I apologize. Go ahead on amendment number 9, sir. Yes, please. Uh, well, yes, I agree that, um, that uh, a more narrow focus on uh, particular practices that are, have sometimes been cited that uh, it's universally agreed now are, are un, uh, unethical, un unorthodox, or abusive uh, would be preferable. And um, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe if I had more time, I could, I could uh, draft other language that would uh, define those, um, define uh, what those, that type of so-called aversion therapy is. Um, but uh, I think that um, for, as a concise statement, this amendment um, does express adequately uh, the type of uh, the type of abusive practices that um, people are most concerned about. So I, I think that, um, and, and again, would leave um, would leave un, uh, would not it would uh, prevent the. Uh, uh, government from interfering with ordinary talk therapy uh, that is not abusive in nature or not coercive in nature. And so I, I would suggest that the assembly should support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? No. Mr. Perez Verdier? No. That amendment fails seven to four. Next, we have amendment number 10 by Assemblymember Kennedy. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this gets at to some very specific practices uh, that could befall a uh, minor uh, who is in some kind of um, sexual orientation or identity crisis. Uh, and this just basically speaks to the fact that there are certain very permanent things that, you know, a 12-year-old or a 9-year-old or a 16-year-old would not want to be subjected to until they were really old enough to make that decision themselves. So it's a rather graphic. I mean, if you start to look at some of these uh, things that potentially could be performed on a child that somebody or the child or the child's parent decided, well, you know, I, I, I always wanted a boy, not a girl. Um, so there are certainly potentials here for, um, for how some of this counseling or change efforts could be abused and this spells it all out and says you can't do these things to a child uh, other than you know it does recognize the fact that there are certainly extreme incidences with uh, actual uh, 
uh, biological sex characteristics when you're talking about chromosomes and the variations of um, irregular chromosomes, uh, there may be a need for a physician to do certain procedures. So it makes an exception for that. But otherwise, it basically lists uh, all of the things that you would not be allowed to do to a child in an effort to do more permanent related uh, treatments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Thanks. You know, I, I, I have to assume that all of these things are loudly illegal somewhere, um, apparently not in our code. Um, but then Mr. Um, Dunbar and earlier said that just because it's somewhere else illegal doesn't mean we shouldn't have it illegal in our code. And I sure hope these things aren't happening. I'll support you. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Allie? Yeah, can I go ahead and have Peter speak on this, please? Sure. Thank you. Yes, um, I think that uh, this uh, amendment number 10 highlights uh, an irony uh, uh, of, the, of the legislation, which is that it seeks to prohibit um, even very modest uh, counseling efforts that involve nothing more uh, intrusive uh, than simply uh, conversation, but uh, voluntary conversation between a client and a, and a therapist. And yet, uh, in protecting uh, uh, counseling related to uh, gender transition and, and assisting a person undergoing gender transition, it effectively protects um, these practices that have very serious, as, as was stated, very serious lifelong consequences that are very serious physical interventions, um, including, uh, including uh, surgeries, uh, body-altering surgeries, and um, medications, uh, both puberty-blocking uh, hormones and cross-sex hormones, uh, which com in combination can result in uh, infertility, permanent infertility, and so forth, that um, if there is concern about um, abusive physical uh, abusive acts upon the body that are that uh, uh, may allegedly have uh, taken place with respect to sexual orientation uh, change efforts, we should be equally concerned with um, abusive interventions upon the bodies of people who are experiencing uh, gender dysphoria and are um, not of, of an age where they can um, give consent to this type of radical um, change because they cannot consider the long-term consequences of it adequately. So um, I think that this is a, a valuable amendment in um, uh, treating, um, treating equally um, this type of physically abusive practice regardless of what its goal is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break.
looks like we got over that uh, technical glitch and we are back. Um, Miss Howard? I'm okay. Okay. Sure. So we're going to go ahead and just take a, another quick short break.
seats. We're going to get started again. Sorry about the technical issues. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, call for the vote of Amendment 10, and then we'll just do a audible from uh, Ms. Allard. So uh, members may proceed to vote on Amendment number 10. Mr. Peterson. Mr. No. Uh, point, point of order. I don't think we were ready to vote yet. Uh, I, I had asked for any further discussion and it didn't look like we had any, but if you would like to further discuss this amendment, we can do so. Mr. Chair, I call the question on this amendment. Okay. Uh, there's a call to question. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. It's not available. You yeah. do need a second. Okay, got it. Uh, so moved by Mr. Dunbar, uh, seconded by uh, Ms. Zolotel. Members may proceed to vote on the call to question. And um, so, for the so we're yeah, okay, I need to get that in the system. Sure. So, for the public and for the members, uh, this is a, a call to question. Is it a supermajority? Oh no, it is no. not. So, um, what this uh, motion does is it forces a vote on this amendment, Amendment Number Ten. So we're just setting that motion up. And closes debate. And it closes debate, yes. So I have to tell you, I, <laughs> I, I do not know how to clear this, which is very interesting. So I'm going to withdraw amendment number 10. Sorry. And just as a reminder for the members, uh, so the motion that we're about to vote on right now is a call to question. It is not a debatable motion. What this motion will do, if approved, will end debate on amendment number 10, and then we'll go immediately to a vote on amendment number 10. I did not second that. I think it was Ms. Zalatel. It was Ms. Zalatel, correct. Thanks. Okay, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson, this is on the call for the question. How do you vote? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Ms. Kenneth, oh, sorry, Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. The, that motion passes nine to two. With that, we're going to uh, go to uh, vote on amendment number 10. Members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment fails eight to three. Ms. Howard? I'm sorry, but I, can I just reconsider? I know it won't change the vote or anything, but the prior one that we voted for, I, I just messed up my voting. I just wanted, it's a reconsideration. So I, I apologize. On amendment number 10? Yes. She voted yes. So I have on, on the record that you voted yes for amendment number 10. Yeah, I would like to change my vote to no. 
if I can re we can reconsider or I'm not sure okay. how that works. Uh, I apologize. Sure. So, um, yeah, so if you intended to vote no on amendment number 10. Okay, so then, um, sorry, uh, you, are, you weren't in the uh, prevailing side for that because that, that uh, amendment failed eight to three. So uh, someone else would have to make that motion to reconsider. I'm just confused. The, the vote records that she voted yes. That's, so I think what Ms. Allard is, is stating that she wanted to change her vote from yes to no. Okay, I will move to reconsider. Thank you. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any um, objection to reconsideration? Okay, wait, I apologize. Just leave it. It's me. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. It, I totally messed up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I didn't see my name on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So next we have amendment number 10 by assembly member LaFrance. Is there a motion? Excuse me, 11. And uh, Austin Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, throughout let me this just say, oh. um, let me just repeat. So this is amendment number 11 by assembly member LaFrance and Austin Quinn Davidson. Is there a motion? Oh, move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Who wants to speak to this? I can speak to it, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so throughout, as Mr. Dunbar said, we've been working on this for several months, and we've gotten a lot of feedback. And I think there's been a lot of confusion about this ordinance. And uh, one of the primary areas that there's been confusion is that we are attempting to take away religious rights. And that is not what we're trying to do with this ordinance. And in fact, um, spent months with Mr. Gates crafting it so that it did not apply to those um, acting substantially in a pastoral or religious capacity. And so the intent of the ordinance is, is not to do that. I just want to make that very, very clear. And to make it crystal clear, I've brought forward this amendment. So I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ballard. Thank you. Um, Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to the amendment. Um, and, and I'd like to also say thank you to um, Assemblywoman uh, Quinn Davidson, I appreciate your thoughtfulness on this one. So here, um, after the word care professional, the very last sentence, I would like to add also professionals who engage with minors in a professional manner to include uh, camp counselors, school counselors, school nurses, and athletic coaches and teachers. I'm asking this just so that I know Actually, it's apologies Second. before, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Allard. Um, I'm asking this because I know my daughters, um, and I know how they reach out, and as elite athletes, um, they're very close to their coaches and their teachers. Um, they do go to ski camps, and I want them to have the ability, if they're going through some sort of anything, I would like them to be able to reach out and talk to these individuals that they spend um, eight plus hours with five, six, seven days a week, if that's um, something in the assembly would consider. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, did you want to speak to this amendment to the amendment? Uh, I will, um, but I'd also like to be um, kept in the queue, Mr. And Mr. Chair. Thank sure. you. Um, I think this is important, too, because we know that one of the most important things we can do for our kids is to build a community of support around them. Um, I remember back in my days on the uh, Anchorage School Board, um, there was a program that went around statewide called Asset Building, and um, it was a, a pretty powerful way of helping communities understand how other adults in a child's life, other than just their parents, played a major role. And a lot of times, you know, you can think of teachers just about academics, but we know that's not true. And uh, it's the same thing with athletic coaches. They are more than just teaching you how to play baseball or ski. Um, they become confidants. And something that we can do to help protect teenagers specifically um, in their 
in their human growth and development, if you will, I think is important. So if we add these people on here, not only do we basically free them up from the risk of having a, a lawsuit brought against them, we will actually uh, uh, encourage uh, students to make those kinds of um, connections with other adults. So I think either way, um, this is a win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton, did you want to speak on the amendment to the I, amendment? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I actually, I'd appreciate the goal of this, but I believe um, should Amendment 12 pass um, um, uh, improving the wording on um, what a provider means that those are, that, that this is taken care of. And uh, so I'd recommend um, against this amendment to the amendment um, and then we vote on 12. Should that fail, then amend this. But I think um, looking at 12, it would cover that, that, you know, your coaches and so on would not be covered by this. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson, on the amendment to the amendment. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with Mr. Weddleton. I think that the Amendment 12 is a lot cleaner way to make the legislation crystal clear to folks. So I would urge others to vote no on Ms. Um, Allard's Amendment to the Amendment, which would carve out sort of, you know, a certain select group of people rather than making it as clear as 12 does. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, Ms. LaFrance has joined me in this amendment. I, she and I separately emailed Dean, so I forgot about that, but we are um, both uh, independently wanted to bring this amendment and are happy to do it together. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I was going to comment along the lines of Ms. Quinn Davidson on Mr. Weddleton's suggestion and I um, urge that you, a no vote for this amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Ms. Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm just kind of checking on the language here in terms of looking at 12. And it looks to me like the requirement is for a person who performs counseling as part of the person's professional services. Um, so in other words, uh, there could certainly uh, be people that don't necessarily, um, are not licensed for professional purposes for counseling. So would they then be excluded in 12? I mean, I know we haven't gotten to that yet, but I want to make sure that we're actually going to be addressing uh, those people that maybe don't fall in that category but might have access to the potential for uh, counseling, if you want to call it that, students or minors. So I guess I'm trying to make sure that we're really going to get at this in 12 rather than just voting down the amendment to 11. And so that's a question directed to one of the sponsors of Amendment yes, Number 12. Okay, you. if I might. Go ahead, Mr. Constant. Thank you. I, I believe whether you are um, in support or opposing yeah. this, the content of the amendment, it's more germane to 12 either way. 11 is in discussion about faith leaders, pastors, etc. 12 is about professionals, licensing, osteopaths, nurses, etc., which is all of that classification of different job classes. And so for the purposes of cleanliness in terms of our legislating, I would offer that number 12 is the proper place to have this conversation, not number 11. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment to the amendment fails nine to two. We're now back at the main amendment. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had to remember my question. Um, in regard to this one, I had a, a question to the makers that how does this pertain to a counselor who is a licensed counselor, therapist, whatever you want to call it, 
but they uh, are of a particular uh, religion, and they advertise that they provide their services with that worldview, with that perspective. So if somebody says they are a you know, they, they counsel within some kind of religious capacity, but they are a licensed therapist that can do any other kind of counseling or any, you know, maybe non-religious counseling at the same time. Would they be included or are they specifically excluded? Thank you. I think that was for the sponsors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which of the sponsors would like to address that question? I can give it a try, Mr. Chair, and then if Suzanne wants to weigh in, or um, Mr. Gates, who helped us draft it. Go ahead. So I think that the key word here, uh, Ms. Kennedy, is substantially. And so it really depends on what the su substantial activity. If you have a counselor who's licensed, who's um, you know, engaging in therapy, that person needs to follow the rules for the licensed therapist. If you have a religious leader in a church who is giving advice and there happens to be some therapeutic conversation in there, but it's not substantially in the capacity of the healthcare professional, then this exemption or this, um, you know, making clear, this language that's clear here would apply. Thank you. Not hearing anything further, uh, members may proceed to vote on amendment number 11. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. My, my, my vote is yeah. I'm sorry. My vote is yeah. That amendment passes 11 to 0. Next, we have amendment number 12 by Assembly Members Rivera, Quinn Davidson, and Constant. Is there a motion? Move to amend oh. uh, amendment 12, adding at page 2, section 1. By state Move to approve, Mr. Constant. Professional Licensing Association and Licensed Services. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, that was a move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, did you want to explain that any further, Mr. Constant? Uh, yeah. The the there was this thread in the public hearings and through the emails that we received that uh, this would uh, be so overbroad that it would just be everyone, including the janitor and the dog walker. And we wanted to make sure that it was really clear that no, we're really talking about people who are practicing a licensed accredited profession of counseling counseling services that generally speaking their guilds will say don't do this so we want to make sure we're targeting as narrowly as possible that, that field so that's the purpose of this amendment thank you mr Wendell. thanks um yeah, this is a great help actually it really does clear things up but a question um looking at the um miss allard's amendment and uh, miss kennedy's comments you know, this says State Professional Licensing Board. Is there a way to clarify this that it would be licensing for, you know, like, you know, she's wearing a licensed soccer, soccer coach, right? Um, that's not really what we mean here. What we mean is license for therapy or psychology or sociology. Ah, ah, hold on, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, was that a question uh, for question. the sponsors? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would one of the sponsors like to address that? I can take that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So right after the bold portion, Mr. Weddleton, it says to provide professional counseling. So a person licensed by state professional licensing board or accredited professional licensing association to provide professional counseling. Did you have a follow-up, Mr. Well, yeah, well, so, in, so I think the case in Ms. Allard's amendment before but that you know someone may go to their coach as their counselor because it's someone they're close to and, and feel comfortable speaking about tough issues with and is that is that licensed soccer coach um, now providing professional counseling that would be covered by this 
I think that's probably no. Okay. Yeah, I think that was. <laughs> uh, so the the sponsors I'm answered down. no on that. Okay. Yeah. If Miss Allard wants to pursue that, I'll leave it for her then. That okay. Is. Well, she's in the queue, so we'll get to Miss Allard. Um, thank you, Miss Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is similar, but I want to know specifically about school counselors. School counselors are definitely licensed uh, as counselors, and they also play that role of being part of the school personnel, so they're definitely interacting with students. Um, so anyway, so does this include them, or they would be excluded? Or do we need to specifically exclude that particular um, uh, type of professional? Thank you. Thank you. Which of the sponsors would like to address that question? Go ahead, Mr. Constant. I wouldn't be supportive of excluding school counselors, and I understand that others might be, but I believe that school counselors would, in fact, fall under this rubric if they work as a counselor in school. And so I think that is a conversation for debate. So coaches, no, coaches don't provide professional counseling, even though they might do informal counseling. And so we, we aren't going for the informal or the unlicensed even, it's, it's really those. But I would, I would hazard that um, school uh, counselors would in fact be and should be incorporated under this. They wouldn't be prohibited. It would if you amended it. They, yeah, they would, they, would, they would be included under this ordinance. Anything further, Ms. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm still confused as to what they, what we believe would be inclusive or exclusive regarding school counselors, because this, after we fill out this portion about who, who a provider is, those people are not allowed to provide any sexual orientation change counseling. A school counselor, as like a school nurse you know, being both, well, okay, I'll make a distinction with the school nurse, but the school counselor is going to be a professionally licensed counselor in the school. So are we saying that we don't want the kids to go to the school counselor because they're going to be prohibited from practicing any kind of counseling based on sexual orientation, but they could go to the school nurse because the school nurse's primary job is not to talk about these things. So this, their, the student has access to the nurse, but the student would not have access to the counselor. Was that correct? No. Thank uh, you. Ms. Quinn Davidson would like to respond. Oh, I could defer to Mr. I guess I'll be quick, and then if Mr. Constable wants to weigh in. So the whole purpose of this ordinance is to protect children. And so why would, I, I just think Ms. Kennedy's kind of on the wrong track if she's trying to carve out all of these people that could still do home harmful practices. That just doesn't make sense to me. And a school counselor, if, it, if that counselor is a licensed counselor, this applies to them and there's no reason it shouldn't. So I would definitely oppose the, or the amendment. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just add briefly, sure. and, and nurses. Nurses are licensed, practical, registered, certified, even nurses assistant. so. Thank you. Ms. Allen? Uh, yeah, so I guess my comment is, though, when we're saying licensed, um, most of the time the coaches and soccer coaches, they are licensed because they usually dual it. So they're either a teacher, which is a licensed teacher, which means they are a licensed professional. That's why I felt it was important in there. And I just want to make this other comment. We are literally tying the hands of our children feeling comfortable talking to anyone regardless of how they feel sexually, you are tying the hands of every child to go to someone and just say, I'm feeling some sort of way. Can I talk to you? Like our kids can't go to anybody without that person being dragged through the mud. And it, it's unbelievable. I just don't understand how you can sit there and tell my 15 year old daughter, Hey, by the way, I don't care what you think. And you don't go talk to anybody because you might actually cause them to lose their license if they sit there and talk to you about comforting you. Maybe maybe the nurse just sits there and says, I, I, I'm sorry you feel this way. How can I guide you? How can I help you? I mean, 
We are taking the rights of our children away. So when you say you're protecting the children, actually you're not. You're setting them up for suicide. You're setting them up for other issues that they can have, mental issues, depression. They might go on drugs. You don't know what's going on in your child's life all the time. And these people can come in and help. So, again, I have children, and we have five members sitting here on the assembly that don't. And I would prefer for you not to speak on behalf of my children and tell me what I can and cannot do. So all I'm asking, since we all know this ordinance is going to pass with flying colors, if it's at all possible that we can just make a little bit of a concession to protect those children who have no protection, because now you've taken that away from them and you've taken it away from their parents. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So a lot of what Ms. Allard just said was wrong, perhaps dangerously so, 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 but perhaps it only comes from misunderstanding of the ordinance and how it's crafted. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had children. So the Excuse me, Ms. Hallard, that's <laughs> order. Go so, ahead, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the ordinance prohibits a very specific kind of act, which is conversion therapy. It doesn't prohibit all of the other things we're talking about, this parade of horribles. Absolutely, a counselor, a counselor can still counsel a child on a variety of topics. They can't do that one specific thing, which is conversion therapy, which we receive a ton of evidence indicating is akin to a form of child abuse. Um, it, it is something that is deeply harmful. That's one. That's the only thing that this ordinance bans, is that practice, not all the other things. And then two, so this is a list, uh, not an exhaustive list, but this is a list of people it does apply to, right? So these are the people it does apply to. So everyone else, it does not apply to. It does not apply to that soccer coach. And to Ms. Allard's point about, well, a soccer coach is licensed as a teacher and licensed as a, as a soccer coach. True. But they are not licensed, I assume, as a, uh, they are not licensed to provide professional counseling. So that's the key definitional point. This applies to people who are licensed to provide professional counseling. And so it does include the school nurse. It does include the, uh, the school counselor, certainly. And it pro prohibits that group of people from doing this one specific thing. It is narrowly tailored in that regard. And all of the other people you're bringing up uh, that aren't uh, a license to provide professional counseling, it does not apply to them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Well, uh, th thanks. And, um kind of tend to agree with Mr. Dunbar, except on one little aspect here when you said that, you know, it says professional counseling, including, and then it has a list, and you said these are the people, but it says, but not limited to. So that really means everybody. That's, including, but not so limited. That is limited. That, hold on, Mr. Dunbar. Was that a question to Mr. Dunbar? Well, it's a, I, uh, I will make another question. So given that... Otherwise, the Mr. Dunbar, is, I need you to get in the queue. Okay, so given that the... Um, this is the list that matters. Can we, can I, uh, I guess I'll move to remove, um, but not limited to. Is there a second? Actually, Mr. Chair, I would second. move to extend debate for one more hour, please. Second. second. Sure, yeah, we can do that really quick. So that was moved by Mr. Constant, seconded by Mr. Dunbar to extend debate by one hour to 1030. Uh, is there any objection? Okay, seeing none, uh, debate is extended uh, by one hour to 10.30. So there was a move, uh, motion to amend the amendment by Mr. Weddleton. Who was the second, Mr. Weddleton? I was. Ms. Allard, thank you. Um, did you want to speak to that amendment, to the amendment, Mr. Weddleton? Well, I think that would bring a lot of comfort to a lot of people. You say, okay, because I, you know, the licensed professionals and in my research and when we've heard, you know, the people do the licensing and their associations and so on do say that conversion therapy is not effective or harmful. Um, so that makes sense. And then you list a lot of um, positions that seem to make sense, but that, but not limited to opens the door to, I think, the concerns we've heard that it could be the soccer coach and so on um, or whatever. Um, so if this is really an inclusive list, let's delete that phrase and get to the clarity that Mr. Dunbar suggested is here. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I oppose this amendment to the amendment. And the reason is illustrated by something that happened tonight. Someone brought up school counselors. They're not on that list. It's very difficult to create a comprehensive list. And there are certainly some people who 
we just haven't thought of. You and I have actually had this discussion several times in the um, Community Economic Development Committee about these exhaustive lists versus not exhaustive lists and, and you know, is a bowling alley a something or other, right? Because there are things that we just don't imagine. Um, this is an illustrative list. This is, these are some examples of people this would apply to. And these are people that people think of when they think of people that are licensed to provide professional counseling, right? So I don't think you can get rid of that, but not limited to. First of all, I, I think it would not have a, a huge effect. I think still, um, I, I think in, in, in large part, you, you get into a squabble and then probably would apply to that person either uh, anyway. Um, but again, because this is an illustrative, not exhaustive list, I don't think you should take out that not limited to. Um, if you did, perhaps you could just delete the whole thing, which we've done in the past too at the Community Economic Development Committee. But I think, unfortunately, that would create even more fear in the community that this does apply to them. Because they can look at this list and say, well, I'm not one of these things, um, but I am licensed to provide professional counseling, so it probably still does apply to me. Versus, I would hope that a soccer coach um, or certainly a parent or someone like this would look at this and say, I am not licensed to provide professional counseling, and I'm not one of these things. So chances are this does not apply to me. So for that reason, I oppose the amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Yeah, I oppose the amendment to the amendment because it all has to be read in context. Um, you would pretty much do what Mr. Dunbar just said, which is look at the list and say, am I like any of these things to provide and licensed to provide professional counseling? You know, is that my job? Is that my role? Um, to construe it otherwise, it's a little bit nonsensical and really isn't how statutory construction works. Um, and again, we still can't, we can't take this provision outside of the entire ordinance. So if you think about it in, inside of the entire ordinance, it's about professional services for counseling. So you have to have that lens on it. Um, and there is a limited sphere of people who can do that. And it's not soccer coaches. It's not ski coaches. It's not cheerleading coaches. It's not dance teachers. So um, I, I think um, the, it, it's great how it's originally written. So I would urge uh, to, to vote against the amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Ms. Allen. Can I ask if Mr. Uh, Spix can type? Sure. Okay. Mr. And, and specifically on what question? Specifically on the but not limited to. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, was this a question for me, for Peter Sprigg? Sure. So, Mr. Sprigg, this is Felix Rivera. We're currently debating an amendment to the amendment to amendment number 12, and this amendment to the amendment seeks to delete um, the phrase, but not limited to. Um, well, um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, I am inclined to support that amendment to the amendment um, because of the concern uh, about the scope of the, um, of who the bill applies to being um, otherwise, uh, you know, not clear and uh, potentially uh, too broad. So, uh, I um, would be inclined to support that amendment to the amendment. Did, did you have a follow-up, Ms. Allen? Um, not with that. May, can we ask Dean's opinion on this, please? To the, sure. Absolutely. Mr. To Gates? You. Mr. Gates? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were actually recording on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> no worries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to speak to this list of professions here, and uh, I helped draft this ordinance. In drafting it, we looked at Title Eight of the Alaska Statutes. And Title Eight is our professional licensing title, and then um, we selected terms here that align exactly with the terms in Title Eight, 
for certain professional occupations that require a license from usually a licensing board and so forth. And we listed all that probably might or could provide this type of counseling. And to be quite honest, I think the list is quite comprehensive. And I don't think taking out, um, but not limited to, does any harm because we've covered them all. If there's, I guess, some statutory amendments to Title VIII to create some new category of profession that might provide counseling services, maybe we pay attention and add it to this ordinance. But uh, I just wanted to mention how comprehensive we tried to make this list of professions while we were drafting the ordinance. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> members may proceed to vote. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? This is on Amendment 12? This is Amendment to the Amendment Number 12. It is to take out the words, but not limited to, in Amendment Number 12. Okay. Um, yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? No. Mr. Perez Verdia? No. That amendment to the amendment fails seven to four. We now have the main amendment before us. Any further discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Oh, excuse me, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to be clear on this. So what this says then is that an unlicensed, untrained, non-professional could actually provide sexual orientation change efforts. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Constant. Yes, in fact, that is true. And uh, it turned out we received a very acute communication from somebody who provides sexual orientation change efforts. And uh, this will allow him to continue doing that, much to the chagrin of the children who will be harmed by that practice. And so, yes, this carve-out does allow that, and we concede that because we recognize that the effort of this is to communicate broadly to the community of providers that we do not allow this, licensed providers that we do not allow this in Anchorage. So, yes, it absolutely is true, and it's sad, but that's the reality we face. We compromise in, a, in an ordinance that meets in the middle all of the interests. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on amendment number 12. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That amendment passes nine to two. Are there any further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Alito. Um, going back to Mr. Waddleton's amendment number two, um, I moved to amend, um, and it was, it passed. Um, I moved to amend, uh, it would say D, parent and family rights. I moved to amend the word family to guardian. Second. Um, and briefly, that's just, oh, sorry. Okay. I apologize. Mr. Waddleton says it was Amendment 2B. Bravo. That's out of order. No, I have it written down. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Alton. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really just um, 
to provide consistency within the, the legislation um, and for the title of that section to reflect the actual uh, language within it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. I appreciate the improvement in the wording and support. <laughs> Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Up, it may move that. Yeah, make it up. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Peterson, this is on the amendment to amendment number two to change the word family to guardian. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That amendment passes 11 to 0. Are there any further amendments? Okay, not hearing any then. Uh, we're at the main motion and general discussion. Is there any further discussion on the main motion? I move to postpone until September or our first meeting. September 15th. 15th. Second. That was different. It was. It was a motion. The clerk is going to clarify. Thank you. There was a motion to postpone to a time certain until September 15th. It failed 8 to 3. Okay. So the clerk has clarified that that motion has already been made and it has failed. So we can't make that motion again. So do I have to make it to the 29th? That is a, a, a different motion. Okay. okay. So I move to postpone to the 29th. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Whittleton? Yeah, I would like to see this fully written out uh, with all the amendments so we can review it and make sure we got things right. This this is an important, um, big deal, and, and I think we should take that time. And, and again, like we did the classic bag ban. We should have done it then, and we regretted not doing it. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone this item to September 29th. Mr. Chair, Mr. Constant, I actually would like to speak to this. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, for the members who are considering delay, this project started two years ago. This project has formally been before us for months. We have another hour by which we can have this conversation. And I strongly urge my peers to vote no. And let's get this done, please. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to point out that we haven't had a bunch of amendments passed. We actually have only had two amendments that passed, both very short. The first uh, one is the one we just spoke about, the parent and guardian rights. It's a four-line amendment. And then Amendment 12. Those are the only amendments that have passed. So I think we should move forward tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That motion fails seven to four. We now have the main motion before us. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I assume that uh, some of my colleagues are going to make um, more sweeping remarks that are more eloquent than my own. So I wanted to make some fairly narrow um, points about the law as it's written. And, and I appreciate the work that my colleagues have done. And there were two people that testified that I thought were particularly impactful. One was Dr. Reynolds and the other was Ms. Shortell. And um, to Ms. Shortell's point about uh, the legal standard and the idea this could be legally challenged. So um, I believe that this ordinance as is written would, would survive what's called strict scrutiny. I think it is narrowly 
tailored to fit a compelling government interest. Uh, the compelling government interest is to protect minors from this uh, particularly damaging form of pseudoscience. Um, and it's narrowly tailored, tailored in that it only applies to a very specific set of providers uh, in a certain set of circumstances. So I, I uh, I believe it's narrowly tailored to a to a compelling government interest. But as she said, she said it sort of quickly, and so it might have slid by some folks, that actually some courts have found that this doesn't even need to be held up to uh, that compelling interest, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, that level of, of scrutiny. That is, it, it is, because it regulates conduct, it's instead subject to a rational basis test. Um, and if that's the case, then this passes with flying colors. Um, and, you know, perhaps it will, um, a, a lawsuit will be brought, perhaps it will go to the Ninth Circuit or even beyond. Um, based on her testimony, I, I believe this is uh, con uh, constitutional. Um, Dr. Reynolds' point, I think, uh, laid out very well um, how these have been uh, rejected by um, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, how this has been rejected by so many licensed professionals, by so many associations, by the APA, by the AMA, by so many others. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make, Miss um, Kennedy had talked about uh, unlicensed uh, providers of uh, this, I'm not going to call it a service, this, um, this form of trauma imposed on these minors. Um, I, I think that, I hope that there is another set of laws that would apply to them. That is, if you are in an unlicensed practice of a profession, typically there's another set of laws that, that stop that. Um, but as Mr. Constant said, we wanted to narrowly tailor this ordinance, or they, the, uh, the sponsors did, and so they didn't expand it to that group. But I hope that group would be prevented from providing unlicensed uh, therapy or counseling in a, in, a, in a realm where they are supposed to be licensed. And I hope that's something we can agree on. Uh, and because of uh, the way it is constructed, uh, and because of the underlying moral points, I, uh, I support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Dunbar made many of my points. I just want to emphasize a few uh, quickly. Um, I think it's important for us to realize and acknowledge the testimony we received about the real harms that this type of therapy has caused individuals in our municipality. Um, so this isn't some perspective harm, it's a real demonstrated harm um, happening in our community. Um, similarly, I think um, we have narrowly tailored the response to that harm and, and preventing that harm is a very compelling interest for the government um, and us to, uh, to undertake. And we've done so in a narrow way. We, we didn't get every person who might be engaged in this activity. Um, and we have heard from experts who, um, and again, Dr. Reynolds, I thought was particularly compelling, um, that this kind of therapy is harmful. Um, so I agree that we have, um, we're doing the right thing. We're doing it in a conscientious way that achieves the goal um, in a very specific, in the most narrow way, really, that we can do it. Um, and I would urge support of this ordinance. And I thank um, everyone who testified and the sponsors uh, for all of their work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. You might go. Sorry, wrong red button there. Thanks. I will support this. Um, you know, I think with the amendments that we've got in here, we have protected uh, uh, the family, uh, parents and guardians in their um, counseling and take care of their kids. Uh, we protected faith leaders in the activities they would do. Uh, we've also clarified the list of people who it applies to. And, and I do find that those that are constrained, um, who would find themselves constrained by this, are already constrained by the professional organizations and, and in many cases their licensing anyway. Um, you know, I think in my early statements, I said I would want any therapy to be very expansive and, and to look at every direction a person might go. And, and I suspect that really does happen in most cases. And, and the fundamental thing here where conversion therapy has an assumption that, um, you know, members of the legacy, lesbian, gay, or LGBTQ community are broken, I, I find that that's wrong. They're not. 
and looking at my family and friends and my colleagues here, um, you're not broken. You're good, decent people living your lives. And um, to the extent this uh, supports that, um, that's a very good thing. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I think I tried my best to make this a little more well-rounded because I think one of the problems with this piece of legislation is that it is one-sided, um, that it really only serves to protect those who want to uh, support and promote homosexuality and gender change. And there's really no, if, if any, yeah, there's really no acknowledgement of those of the opposite opinion. So it really seeks to limit any freedom of choice and particularly um, for the vast majority of minors that this could impact. Um, there's always another side uh, and we heard a lot of that from a lot of the testimony uh, through the last several days, not to mention all the emails we've been getting over the last two to three weeks. Um, I think what concerns me about this is the that allows the government to play a role in determining the upbringing of a child. And, and that's, in some cases, at the exclusion of the parent's role. So it it is just really kind of hard for me to fathom uh, that in an age where we're trying to strengthen families, knowing all the negative impacts that breakdown of families is creating in our society, that we're, and we're spending millions of dollars on the alcohol tax right now trying to figure out how to build them back up, and yet we drive this wedge. Um, and, and that's pretty um, frustrating, and I'm sure that it's going to exasperate some of those efforts in some cases. We've talked a little bit about the risk of lawsuits. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, one of the things that occurred to me when we first started uh, talking about this ordinance was a particular statewide situation that our Supreme Court um, settled a few years back when we had a law that was passed by the voter initiative, a, a voter initiative that attempted to deny a teen girl access to abortion without permission of her parents. And the Supreme Court overturned that legislation that we voted in, the majority of Alaskans voted in. And they based their overturning that decision on several constitutional rights. One was being uh, the right to privacy. Uh, those rights were established in 1972 in the Constitution of the state. It also was seen to violate the equal protection laws and due process laws of minors. So it's been well established that minors cannot be denied a right to deal with their health-related issues. The Supreme Court has upheld that. So by criminalizing and prohibiting them access to mental health services for this very personal and potentially life-changing counseling, you'll essentially be depriving them of that and violating their right of privacy, their right of protection, and their right to due process. So interestingly enough, the majority opinion on the decision said a statute infringing on a constitutionally protected right deserves close attention. Our duty to uphold the Alaska Constitution is paramount. It takes precedence over politics of the day and our own personal preferences. And this is the legal battle that I think you'll be fighting in court. It's might, maybe not the right to free speech or overreach of a state licensed medical provider. Um, it may not be the right to parental rights. It'll be the denial of minors to seek medical attention, including counseling on their own volition, uh, the denial of their equal protection rights and the denial of the right to privacy. So we'll see um, if any of that plays out. Um, and I think, again, you know, I'll just say that we could have spent some time really trying to make this work without causing confusion, without causing, without criminalizing our school counselors for crying out loud. Um, anyway, but all of this is too broad. And, um, you know, you can say you protect one, but at the other, the other side of it is you absolutely need another, you leave another out and put them in a place where they're neglected and their needs are being denied. And I think we could have done better to find a balance. So I'll be a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Allard. Thank you. So I would like to finalize this with 
five questions to Mr. Sprigg, and then I will just have a short, quick remark, if that's possible, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sprigg, are you still on? Oh, I think we need to call him. Hello, this is Peter Sprigg. <clears throat> Hi, Mr. Sprigg. This is Ms. Allard. I was calling you just to ask you. I have one, two, three, four, five questions. Are you able to answer these um, tonight? Um, yes, I'm happy to if you um, want to ask me. Can you repeat what you just said? I'm sorry. He said he's happy to. Um, the first question is, the ordinance says on page 1, lines 17 and 18, that these therapies violate fundamental human rights principles. Do you agree that human rights principles are at stake here? I do, uh, but I don't think that they are the same <laughs> principles that the, uh, that the sponsors believe are at stake. I think that Bill uh, runs the threat of uh, violating uh, the constitutional rights to uh, free speech and to freedom of religion. Um, freedom of speech, particularly on the part of the therapists themselves, because essentially what this does is it imposes a limit on what therapists can say in the context of, of a therapy session, in the privacy of the therapy session with a client. Uh, and freedom of religion really for both the therapist and the client, um, although there are historically have been a number of motives uh, why people may experience uh, their same-sex attractions as unwanted and why they might therefore seek sexual orientation change efforts. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt that in, in the current climate, the, the principal motivation, both for most clients who seek this and for most therapists who provide it, is um, a, a, re, a religious motivation, a desire to live their lives uh, in a way that's consistent with the teachings of their faith and to uh, obtain help in uh, doing that successfully. Uh, so I think it, it, it violates the free exercise of religion. It violates uh, several principles um, related to the um, counseling profession itself. It violates the confidentiality. Um, I, I think it's really not the business of the government what um, people discuss within the privacy of the therapy uh, room. So it viol violates both confidentiality and privacy rights. Um, it violates uh, parental rights. Uh, well, I think that the um, uh, well, I think that the, the stories about uh, this taking place for minors as a result of parental coercion are greatly exaggerated. Um, nevertheless, it is a fact that parents are, have both the right and the responsibility to care for, uh, to care for the medical care and, and health care, including the mental health care of their own children, and I think that this uh, seriously interferes with that. And finally, um, it interferes with a fundamental principle within the profession, the counseling profession, of client autonomy. And uh, this was alluded to um, in passing earlier that uh, even the American Psychological Association has acknowledged that um, therapy should be client-centered. But this um, this uh, ordinance would require a therapist to reject the client's goals and to tell the client, no, you may not pursue your own personal goals. Um, and um, and I think that that's a violation of a, of a core principle as well. Thank you. I have another question for you. In lines 46 and 47, the ordinance prohibits any practice that seeks to change a person's sexual orientation and gender identity. But then on page 3, lines 5 and 6, it allows therapy that facilitates a person's identity, exploration, and development. Can you explain to me how a person can develop without changing or change without developing, please? No, I can't explain that, and I doubt that the sponsors of this ordinance can explain it either. Um, I think that uh, that illustrates the uh, uh, problem uh, or uh, sort of a false perception about the nature of sexual orientation change efforts that somehow it is um, a, a, an activity that is a fundamentally different uh, of a fundamentally different nature from ordinary uh, therapy uh, and uh, that's simply not the case um, people who assist those with unwanted same-sex attractions to achieve their goals 
are facilitating a person's identity exploration and development. And, um, and the line to be drawn between that and, um, and uh, efforts to change a person's sexual orientation and gender identity, if that is the, person's, if that is the client's own personal goal, um, is, is a line that is just uh, impossible to draw, in my opinion. I would just point out that uh, the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, which is the leading professional organization that represents um, licensed uh, counselors and therapists who perform this, who, who do this type of work, uh, they, they, they have changed the name that they use for um, this type of therapy to um, what they call SAFE-T, S-A-F-E-T, -S and that stands for Sexual Attraction Fluidity Exploration in Therapy. Uh, so uh, it, the, the idea of um, facilitating a person's identity exploration and development, that's exactly what is happening uh, when, a, when a therapist undertakes uh, what are sometimes called sexual orientation change efforts. So I don't think there can be a sharp line drawn between them. Thank you. I have a few more questions for you. The Assembly Memorandum cites two documents published in 2009 by the American Psychological Association. And you mentioned in your testimony yesterday, sorry, I'm referencing that back, this is part of my notes, that those documents actually call for this type of therapy to be legally prohibited? Were there other findings in their task force report that we should know about? Um, the answer to your first question is no. The, while the... Uh, American Psychological Association Task Force report was undoubtedly critical of the practice of sexual orientation change efforts. At no point in that report did it call for legal prohibitions to be adopted um, on this. And in, um, and in fact, there were other findings that are usually uh, uh, not pointed to that I think would undermine the argument uh, that uh, that there should be a legal prohibition upon this uh, type of counseling. For example, um, opposition to sexual orientation change efforts is based in part on the belief that people are, are born gay, probably as a result of a gay gene or some other biological factor present at birth. However, the APA admits that, quote, there is no consensus among scientists, close quote, about what causes homosexuality and that nurture, quote, unquote, may play a role. Um, in addition, opposition to sexual orientation change efforts is based on the belief that sexual orientation is a characteristic that is fixed and unchangeable. However, the APA has acknowledged that, quote, for some, sexual, ident sexual orientation identity is fluid or has an indefinite outcome, uh, close quote. Um, in addition, um, Opposition uh, to sexual orientation change efforts, especially for children and adolescents, for minors, as, as um, is targeted in this uh, ordinance, such opposition is based on the belief that individuals are generally coerced into undergoing therapy, for example, by parents. However, the APA acknowledges that some people, including children and adolescents, may experience distress about having same-sex attractions and consider such feelings to be unwanted. Uh, and it acknowledged that without any mention of outside coercion. Um, Another point is that opposition to sexual orientation change efforts is premised on the belief that it has no benefits for the clients who undertake it. However, the APA acknowledged, quote, some individuals perceived that they had benefited from SOCE, close quote. Um, Opposition to SOCE, sexual orientation change efforts, is based on the claim that it is always or at least usually harmful to clients. However, and this is a very important point, the APA admits that there is no, quote, valid causal evidence, close quote, that sexual orientation change efforts are harmful. Now, I will... Um, I will elaborate on that, that they, they also assert that there is no valid causal evidence that they are effective in changing sexual orientation. The words valid and causal 
are modifications of the word evidence which raise the standard, kind of raise the bar in terms of the scientific proof. So there is no question there is evidence, anecdotal evidence, that these change efforts have been harmful for some individuals. But um, there is also an abundance of uh, anecdotal evidence that they have been helpful for some individuals uh, who have not been uh, harmed and who have uh, been benefit have, who have benefited and have found them effective. Um, so, and in fact, there is there is also uh, scientific evidence uh, published in peer-reviewed scientific journals that has shown them uh, to be effective and not to be generally harmful. Um, so. Um, but I think the fact that there's no valid causal evidence that sexual orientation change efforts are harmful would suggest against uh, a legal intervention to uh, prohibit them. Uh, another point is the APA uh, acknowledges some of the points that I just made about client autonomy. They acknowledge that licensed mental health providers should, quote, respect a person's parentheses, clients' right to self-determination, close quote, that they should allow the client to choose his or her own goals and, quote, be sensitive to the client's religion, close quote. However, um, in my opinion, therapy bans such as the one proposed for Anchorage directly violate this core ethical principle acknowledged by the APA of client self-determination. And... Um, as noted um, earlier, uh, legislative restrictions on sexual orientation change efforts with minors are based on the belief uh, that ther such therapy always or usually occurs as a result of coercion by parents or other adults. I alluded to this earlier. The APA, however, has acknowledged that concerns about potential coercion could be mitigated by implementing a system of quote, development, developmentally appropriate informed consent to treatment, close quote. So um, while the APA has been critical of sexual orientation change efforts, I think if you read the entire document that they published, it uh, seriously undermines the argument that, that the government should legally intervene to prohibit these uh, pr procedures. I have two more questions for you. This one's going to go back to your testimony from yesterday. You mentioned in your testimony that 2009, the APA had found no scientific studies on change efforts with minors at all. But in the assembly memorandum on page two, they mentioned a 2018 study by the Family Acceptance Project. What can you tell me about this study, please? Well, this study by um, uh, Ryan, Toomey, Diaz, and Russell in uh, the Journal of Homosexuality, uh, First of all, it sampled only people who self-identified as LGBT. Uh, so by definition, that means these are people for whom sexual orientation change efforts were unsuccessful in achieving any goal of uh, altering their sexual orientation. Now, an analogy that has sometimes been raised is um, this is comparable to doing a study about the uh, benefits and harms of marriage therapy by surveying only people who are divorced. Uh, so you, you survey only people whose marriages failed uh, or whose marriage, marital therapy failed and then draw overall conclusions about uh, the quality of marital therapy from that sample. That would be uh, clearly uh, an invalid way of judging, and yet that's what this study represents. It also, uh, this study included only, and it's even in the title of the, of the study, it's called uh, Parent-Initiated Sexual Orientation Change Efforts with LGBT Adolescents. So it includes only um, efforts that were parent initiated. Uh, now I realize a lot of the critics of, um, of change efforts uh, believe that, that it's always parent initiated, but that's simply not the case. Um, essentially this study denies the fact that there are youth who have unwanted same-sex attractions and for whom it is unwanted based on their own personal decision without any particular um, coercion or pressure from their parents. And, second, and finally, the final point about that particular study, and this is true of uh, many of the uh, many of the studies that have been done that are sometimes cited uh, in support or in, in 
criticism of sexual orientation change efforts is that this study made no distinction between um, professional and religious counselors. Uh, and uh, the studies that have um, uh, looked at, uh, that have dealt with those differently, which are a minority, um, suggest that there may be significant differences. So um, it's really not valid to lump all of those in together. Thank you. And this will be my last question to you. The assembly memorandum on the top of page three says a similar law in California, in quotation marks, survived First Amendment challenges. So, Mr. Spring, I know you're not a lawyer, but have there been any recent legal developments that you, we should be aware of? Yes, uh, there was a very interesting development at the U.S. Supreme Court last year in a case uh, dealing with a, a different underlying issue, but some of the same principles in involving free speech. This was a case that came before the Supreme Court uh, involving regulations that the state of California had adopted and placed upon uh, pro-life uh, pregnancy resource centers. And uh, the, uh, these uh, pregnancy centers challenged the law, arguing that it was a violation of their uh, rights under the uh, First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution of their free speech rights uh, to um, have their speech restricted by the state of California. Uh, but California defended the law on the, on the basis of a theory that there is a category of, quote-unquote, professional speech which is different from other types of speech and does not enjoy the same type of constitutional protection because it's carried out in a professional context. Um, this argument was rejected by the Supreme Court, in, uh, explicitly rejected in this case, the uh, Nifla, Nifla versus Becerra, I believe was the name of the case. Um, and in the course of the majority opinion written by Justice Thomas, um, he specifically made reference uh, to the circuit court decisions uh, that had upheld uh, therapy bans, uh, bans upon change therapy for minors in uh, California and New Jersey. And his uh, negative treatment of those um, decisions in this uh, U.S. Supreme Court majority opinion has led some lawyers to say that, in effect, um, those decisions have been abrogated by the Supreme Court, although the court has not directly addressed this issue in the, in the therapy context. Another, um, another court case that's happened within the last year or so was that in the state of Florida, a local uh, ordinance similar to the one being proposed for um, for Anchorage was struck down uh, in the city of Tampa, Florida. And the principal argument used by the judge in that decision was that this was uh, a municipality usurping a role that uh, that properly belongs only to the state. Uh, and again, this is a point I, I mentioned earlier uh, in response to an earlier question that uh, normally the regulation of the state, uh, the regulation of the healthcare profession and the mental health profession is something that rests with the state uh, and is not something that takes place at the local or municipal level. Um, so in now, I don't know the differences between Florida law and Alaska law, but I uh, presume that a similar argument could be made uh, in Alaska. And finally, I will mention what happened recently in New York City. Uh, New York City had passed a, um, a therapy ban of its own and passed it by a large margin in their uh, city council. Uh, they were sued um, by a uh, professional counselor who also happens to be an Orthodox Jewish rabbi who um, objected to uh, this restriction upon his um, activities and uh, referring, uh, looking at the landscape after, the, um, after that NIFLA case from the U.S. Supreme Court and after the statement made in the court about, uh, in that decision about professional speech, the uh, the city of New York decided that they did not think they could successfully defend um, their, uh, their local therapy ban uh, against this court challenge, and instead they repealed 
uh, the ordinance which they had adopted by a large margin just a year or two earlier and paid a settlement of $100,000 to this plaintiff. So I, I would suggest that... Um, if the uh, council for the city of New York um, recommended that they uh, repeal their uh, ordinance uh, and they had to pay a substantial settlement, that um, Anchorage would be highly vulnerable to a similar outcome if um, it were to uh, pass a similar ordinance. Thank you, Peter, for your testimony tonight, and I appreciate you answering all these questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Chair, can I just say something? Okay. Um, in regards to AO 202065, I am wholeheartedly uh, opposed to this ordinance. I don't think it protects the children on both sides, and I would appreciate um, a no vote from everybody else. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Parents can and should communicate counsel and provide guidance to their children following their own beliefs and values through their church or other means. This ordinance protects those rights. Conversion therapy goes beyond that and study after study has shown that this kind of coercion to be harmful to children. There's evidence to suggest, as we've heard, this coercion doesn't work and significant evidence to suggest that it is actually harmful to children. Studies show it can lead to depression, substance abuse, anxiety, homelessness, and even suicide. It's conversion therapy that can set children up for suicide. Homosexuality is not a mental illness, and it shouldn't be treated as one. Every major medical and mental health organization in the United States has issued a statement condemning the use of conversion therapy. Confusion about sexuality isn't unusual for kids. Counseling may be helpful for those kids who are trying to sort out their feelings. This ordinance allows for counseling. It just doesn't allow attempts to force kids into changing who they are. As parents and guardians, we want to do what's best for our kids. And thank you to those who don't have children but advocate on their behalf. For that, I am grateful. It concerns me that parents and guardians who seek to do what's best for their kids may be misguided by counselors who believe conversion therapy is effective and appropriate. This ordinance makes clear it's not. As a mother of three, I love and accept who my children are unconditionally. A person has a right to participate in this form of conversion therapy when they become an adult too. But I guide my children so that they share my values so they can grow up to become thoughtful adults with the capacity to distinguish right from wrong, but more importantly, have compassion for others. The U.S. Supreme Court has refused to accept challenges to similar laws in New Jersey and California. Societal views of homosexuality have evolved in recent years. The majority of Americans now support the same support same-sex marriage. There's no need to change the beautiful and unique person that God created. LGBTQ plus people may be a minority, but they are certainly not abnormal. They deserve to live in a community that safeguards this diversity. I will vote in support of this ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. perez Bridia. This, um, this, this together. You know, I, um, I said something similar when we were talking about another issue that we spent a lot of time on um, um, earlier this, this month. Um, but, you know, one of the things about this process that has made, made me very sad is just the unnecessary attacks that have happened, the, the ac 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 accusations that people are homosexual because they were abused as chil children, the, 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 the references to pedophiles, the, the online comments have been gross, unnecessary, and, and I, I, I want to make sure that I point out that that, that kind of speech and that kind, those kind of ac accusations um, and language are just not appropriate in these, 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 these debates. 
The other thing that's really disappointed me is the efforts to undermine the, the people that are bringing this forward, um, speaking as though they have an agenda and, and accusing them because they don't have children that, that they don't necessarily have a right to, to speak or have, have an opinion about an issue that affects all of us. Um, they're, they're here and they're doing what is right like we all are. Uh, and so I want to make sure that, that in, in the future we do everything we can to, to not limit speech, but to make it clear that these kinds of attacks and this kind of undermining of good people doing good work is, is not, not, not appropriate. So this, this process is also <laughs> shown to throw everything but the kitchen sink at something that you don't uh, agree with. You know, um, and it's just... It's, and then this process to tonight, which, which has, in, in many cases, felt like uh, just an, an opportunity to beat people over the head with what they think um, and not give us an opportunity to go through our normal pro process. This issue, in my opinion, is simple, very simple. As it's been stated before, every major medical and behavioral health organization in this country has come out to say this is dangerous. This is wrong. This is absolutely our role, to ban something that is absolutely wrong and dangerous for children. This is not an overstep. This is absolutely within the work that we should be doing. And our role is to protect the people of Anchorage. So I urge a yes vote on this, and, and I want to make sure that, that, that we, and we understand that at the end of the day, this is about protecting children. And this is about making sure that we take a stand on something that universally is believed by experts as being wrong. I urge my colleagues uh, a yes vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm, I, to be totally honest with you, uh, I'm having a difficult time with this issue. Uh, I've gone back and forth on which way I'm voting on this a half a dozen times, uh, depending on the most recent person to speak. Uh, I do believe that conversion therapy is, is a bad thing and we should ban it, but I'm also worried that we could end up uh, defending ourselves in a lawsuit, which we haven't had a real good track record with lately. And so um, I'm still listening, and I'm still undecided. So uh, um, I'm going to be making my mind up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to say thanks to the comments of my colleagues, um, particularly Ms. LaFrances and Mr. perez Rodriguez, who were really moving and I'm proud to serve with them. Um, this is a bill that would save lives, and it will when we pass it tonight. Um, we know that youth are two times as likely to commit suicide if they go through conversion therapy. And we know that this bill is legally sound. We've heard that from our lawyers. We've heard that from experts like the Trevor Project. We've seen that 20 states and many cities have passed similar legislation. And we know that conversion therapy doesn't work. But still, people are against it. Even with amendments that ensure the right to religious exercise and the rights of parents. And that is so hard for me to understand. And I guess I want to share, you know, what, what Mr. Perez Verdia said. I, I noticed that too. I you know, I received emails saying that I'm a pedophile or um, that I was molested as a child. Someone said that tonight. Um, Mrs. Kennedy actually said that um, LGBT folks are associated with mental illness. Um, we're people. We're real people. And when you say those things to us, it doesn't hurt because it's wrong and we're used to it. But it's sad. It's sad that that's where our culture is. But I know that we will keep moving forward and things will get better. I know that my wife and I will continue to have the loving, healthy relationship we have. 
we'll continue to have fun and explore this town together, and we'll continue to have debates like every couple does um, about who's going to do the dishes or who's going to fold the laundry. I don't understand this continuous separation and tearing down of LGBT families. I don't understand calling an expert who has linked homosexuality to pedophilia. This is Mr. Sprigg. He's argued that homosexuals want to brainwash children in schools, and his group has been labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. That's who Ms. Allard chose to call to speak tonight. I don't understand that. But I hope in time that you will all get to know us and see us as the kind, productive, good community members that the rest of you are. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So a lot of folks have asked, why are three assembly members, quote unquote, pushing this forward? There's been a lot of assumptions made about the motivations of the three sponsors. A lot of lies, frankly, told about us from people who don't even know who we are. The simple truth of the matter is, why are we doing this? Because we are doing what's right. right. We are drawing a clear line in the sand that what we allow as a society and what we denounce. And this ordinance states loud and clear that we denounce conversion therapy. Let's look at the reality on the ground. This is happening in Anchorage. The email testimony we've received and the testimony that we've received here over the phone proves that without a shadow of a doubt. A landslide, and I'll repeat that, a landslide of scientific studies and medical associations have renounced and absolutely debunked this type of therapy. This ordinance seeks to ban this type of therapy from being practiced by licensed medical professionals. We've stated that again and again and again, but there still appears to be confusion around that. It does not ban parents from talking about these issues with their children does not ban religious leaders from talking about these issues in the capacity of their faith. It does not prevent those who have suffered the trauma of sexual abuse from getting help. People can still get the help that they want, but that help when offered by a licensed medical professional should not come from a place that has the potential to cause harm. And conversion therapy causes harm. This help should come from a positive space. So at least to me, the question is pretty simple, as Mr. perez has stated. Why wouldn't we want to protect youth in our community from unethical practices that could lead to harmful outcomes? One day, this isn't going to be an issue. One day, we will have a statewide ban on conversion therapy. And I look forward to some current courageous members of the Alaska State Legislature putting forward such a law. One day, this practice will be banned throughout the United States. And then one day, we're going to look back and we're going to wonder why this was ever a debate and why this practice was ever allowed. So I'm going to be voting yes to ensure the safety of all our youth within the municipality and urge the support of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Constant. Yes, thank you. Before I start, I would ask the members to uh, move to extend for another 10 minutes. So moved. Second. Do, are you going to use the whole 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's been a motion to extend debate by 10 minutes. It's a um, ceiling, <laughs> not a target. Uh, seeing no opposition, that passes. Go ahead, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Oh boy, what a process this has been. 
First, I want to thank the 12th member of our body, Mr. Sprigg, who has invited you to spend more time talking than anyone else. Shocking. As you heard, he's a well-renowned, quote, expert on matters of sexual orientation, divinity, etc. But he speaks on matters well outside of his realm of expertise, that's for sure. He's not a lawyer. His analysis of the law, as our attorney proved for us, is not on point. When I saw him listed as a testifier on this, I thought, oh my goodness, we've made it. Because this individual has a history. That history is such that he stood against Lawrence versus Kansas, which was the law that was struck down, that made it illegal just to be me. I couldn't love openly. I had to hide it or I would go to jail. He stood against that as do many people in our community. He stood against don't ask, don't tell. That law fell. He was a main proponent of Proposition 8 before it fell. Thank God for Edie Windsor. He stood against Obergefell, in which marriage rights were granted to LGBT people across this country in 2015. And he stood against Bostock just this summer that passed and provided that transgender and LGBT people are in fact protected under Title VII. Sex discrimination, discrimination is not allowed. So, in the tide of time, Mr. Sprigg, I can say I'm glad to be on the opposite side of you. I may not be a parent, but I have been a child. And I have been a child in a culture that said it is not okay to be you. It is illegal to be you. You must change. Even so, in this ordinance, I have supported the explicit statement that a parent's rights are not abridged. We have heard so much testimony about how gay people are broken. All of these statistics that aren't accurate, but are old tools used to keep people down to keep people sick and harmed. Why are people broken? Because of the trauma our culture lays upon them. We've heard that this ordinance will break the confidentiality of the relationship between a counselor and a patient. The beauty of this law is we encode a private right of action that will let that child harmed by that practitioner sue them themselves, empower them to stand for themselves when their parents won't stand for them, but instead stand against them. Imagine being that child whose world around them is telling them you don't have a right to be who you are inside. You must be who I tell you who you are, or you will leave my home. I heard from a main leader of this opposition in our community, oh, that doesn't happen. I said, I know dozens of people right now who've been thrown out of the homes by their parents because they refuse to not be gay. Think about that thrown out from your parents' home because they refuse to not be gay. Wow. And then, of course, that activist against LGBT rights admitted that his brother, in fact, is hosting someone who was thrown out by someone because they're gay. This exists. People like to pretend it doesn't and tell these pretty stories. Oh, this is not real. Or we just want to make sure we're taking care of the needs that we think, but not the broader needs of the community. And the broader needs of the community are that we need to protect children. That's what this is all about. So I want to tell just a little story, and I'll conclude here. It's a story of two boys. One boy, about 16 years old, his parents could not accept him. And they forced him through a number of therapies, quote therapies. They forced him to hide himself. Anytime his self started to be exposed, they threatened his home and his life. They sent him to torture. There's another boy 
the same time, whose grandmother said, I support you. The first boy had a very rough go of it and ended up through substance abuse and addiction dying at age 24 because he could never come to peace with himself because his family could not come to peace with him and said, you cannot be who you are. The other boy, well, you know how that story goes. We have a choice. We have heard from members of this community who have been harmed by this practice not 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but in the last five years. And in fact, now they've told us this practice, they're going to continue. And some of them, they'll be able to because they aren't licensed to do it. But hopefully the message gets out that in Anchorage, it's not allowed to do this if you're a professional counselor. Now, a number of people have testified tonight that even the APA doesn't have a firm position on this, the American Psychological Association. And I recognize from my peer in good faith that you are reading a document that's out of date. But in fact, in the most recent guidance position of the American Psychological Association, just published in December of 2018, they have four positions. Position one, APA reaffirms its recommendation that ethical practitioners refrain from attempts to change individuals' sexual orientation. Number two, APA recommends that ethical practitioners respect the identities for those with diverse gender expressions. Position number three, APA encourages psychotherapies which affirm individuals' sexual orientations and gender identities. Position number four, APA encourages legislation which would prohibit the practice of reparative or conversion therapies that are based on the a priori assumption that diverse sexual orientations and gender identities are mentally ill. To my peers, I'm grateful for your support for this matter. I look forward to us passing this and should a legal challenge come, I look forward to us prevailing that we may protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved nine to two. With that, I'm gonna take a five minute break and then I'll come back and outline the rest of the <laughs> tonight.
Yeah. All right, if members can go ahead and take their seats, we're going to get started. You can't just make a general request to speak, you have to make it on one item. So I'm just going to say. <clears throat> okay, so let me lay out. Um, the rest of our time tonight, at least my hope for it. So first, I am uh, going to, after I'm done speaking, request a motion for us to extend to midnight. Then after that, uh, as I stated earlier in the meeting, I will um, open the floor to a motion from Mr. Dunbar regarding item 13A on our agenda. Mr. Chair, uh, can I? Finish. Yeah, I also Thanks. want to do a motion to meet it reconsider before we move up. But. Sure. Um, then uh, after that, uh, I will ask for a motion to reorder the agenda uh, to take up all of our items which are non-public hearing or, excuse me, which do not have any individual signed up for public hearing. So these are items that we could open, close the public hearing, and uh, deliberate and take a vote on, hopefully quickly, uh, and get through as much of that as possible tonight. And then tomorrow, we will meet again to finish the agenda, as I stated, my clear intent. <laughs> so with that, let's go ahead. Um, so Mr. Constant, what was your point before we start that? I just uh, would make a motion to immediately reconsider the previous item and urge a no vote. Sure, we can go ahead and do that before all the other cascading parts. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that? Just let's finish this action. Call it good. Okay. Please vote no. With that, members may proceed to vote on the motion to reconsider 65. Mr. Peterson, this is a motion to reconsider um, 13, 13B, 2020-65. Mr. Peterson. I'm going to skip Mr. Peterson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. On the motion to reconsider. No. Thank you. Mr. Perez Verdia. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, are you there? This is the motion to reconsider.
that motion fails now. Move through 10 to the blue light. Second. Moved and seconded by Mr. Constant. Is there any option? Uh, let, let's actually take the vote. Uh, members may proceed to vote on the motion to extend to midnight. And Mr. Peterson, I don't know if you've joined us, but if you could uh, put yourself on mute until we call on you, please. Thank you. Okay. This is on the motion to extend to midnight, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Just now. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That motion's approved <laughs> 10 to 1. Um, <laughs> so we're extended to midnight. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Weddleton. I, I, um, to that open. With, uh, we'll go ahead and go to Mr. Dunbar. Uh, I move to reconsider item 13A. Second. Can I speak to that briefly, Mr. Chair? Sure. So unlike uh, the prior mo uh, motion to reconsider, in this case, I vote uh, or I urge a yes vote. So there was S version of this that was laid on the table yesterday, um, right before our meeting. And I think for several of us, that gave us pause. We didn't want to pass it right then. Um, but in the intervening 24 hours, I've had a chance to review the ordinance, uh, the S version, and it's it's very straightforward. And it, it is uh, changes that were predominantly asked for by the, in fact, enti entirely asked for by members of this body. Um, I'm also persuaded by Ms. Zolotel's argument last meeting that there is a time element to this ordinance. Um, that is, we need to engage the process of hiring this person, and this person is going to be very... Um, the, uh, the, the, the ongoing crisis, frankly. Um, and so, uh, again, I, I urge a yes vote on reconsideration and give us a chance to, uh, to debate the substance of the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to clarify this before we um, proceed in the queue. Uh, so this is a motion to reconsider, and the motion that we are reconsidering is a motion to postpone. So <laughs> let me go through this cascade. Yeah. <laughs> so if the motion to reconsider is approved, then we will, we will be back at the motion to postpone 79, which then we will debate that motion. And then if we decide not to postpone 79, then we will be back on the motion to approve 79. So with that, Mr. Weddleton, did you want to speak to the motion to reconsider? No, that was on, on not staying till midnight since we're meeting tomorrow anyway, but seemed to fail. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Ms. LaFrance on the motion to reconsider. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually uh, have to think about which vote it means. Um, I don't support reconsidering because I'm working on an amendment and I will not have it done um, in the next few minutes. And so if we take this up now, um, We'll have to wait until Mr. Gates prints it out. And um, I haven't had a chance to work with folks on it. So I'm asking that we still hold off on debating this ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, all right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a kind of a question on this process. If we vote to reconsider and then vote to postpone or vote to not postpone but to actually bring the, uh, the item up again could we not still postpone to the following night um, so that we could have another day because I'm kind of like Miss LaFrance I I really wasn't thinking about that coming back up right away and I certainly understand the timeliness but um, what is the point then of post do we have we would have to post or sorry we would have to vote to reconsider in order to take a different vote on postponing, though. Would that, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I think to answer your question, and it's a good point. So um, if we get through the first two hurdles, which is yes on reconsideration and then no on postponement, 
then we have the, the item before us. What we could do is, like I had stated earlier, we could take action on all these other items, and then we can leave this along with our other public hearing items where we have people signed up to testify until tomorrow. Can, can I? Yeah, you're next, Mr. Dunbar. Go ahead. Thank you. So I, I appreciate what um, Ms. Kennedy and Ms. LaFrance have asked for. I think you should still vote yes on the motion to reconsider because we only get one shot at that. So please vote yes on this. And then we can change the order of the day. We can either postpone it to tomorrow or we can change the order of the day and take it up later. But we only get one shot at voting to reconsider. And so effectively voting no pushes this off until the 15th. And I strongly desire that that not be the case, whether we do it tonight or tomorrow. So, again, please vote yes on this, and then there'll be another uh, a motion that will allow us to put it to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so, just want to echo the comments from uh, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, so, I would urge a yes vote on the motion to reconsider. And then even though we're not there yet, a no vote on the motion to postpone. And then um, we can, as we change the order of the day, uh, take this up last on our list or somewhere in the middle, at least give some time for Mr. Gates to finish up that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Seeing no further discussion, actually, let me just double check. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Before to voting on this. No. Yeah, can you not hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, great. I just wanted to quickly echo the comments that you and Mr. Dunbar made. Uh, I was really disappointed that we didn't get to vote on this last night. I did support the um, postponement just because I wanted to allow time, but I think Mr. Dunbar makes a great argument, and I really hope that we'll, we'll uh, vote on this soon and that folks should vote yes to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote on the motion to reconsider. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. <laughs> Gotta vote. <laughs> <laughs> That uh, motion passes 10 to 1. With that, we're now back on the motion to postpone this item until uh, September 15th. I don't think we really need to <laughs> debate that motion further, so I'm going to go ahead and ask for the vote. The members may proceed to vote. Oh, wait. Urgent vote. Um, oh, unless you want to. <laughs> I'm going to make a superseding motion. Uh, so I move to change the order of the day to take this item up after, um, let's just say for now, 14D. Is that the... Sure. So I can go ahead and go into... Which one do you think we'll do last? Or... So if, if I were to be artful about this, what I would do is... Um, I would lay out all of the items, and then uh, I wouldn't necessarily put a time or uh, put 13A in the mix. I would just say whenever Mr. Gates is completed, we would take that item up in that mix. Can I make a motion? Point of information, the amendments in our email. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, if I, if I were to make the motion, it would be something like this. Um, so take up items 13D. 13E, 13F, 13G, 14A, 14G, and 15A through 15F next, and take up item 13A when that is ready for consideration. So, so second. Moved and seconded. 
Seeing no discussion on that motion, which hopefully that was clear as mud, members may proceed to vote. And um, the, the, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Constant. Mr. Dunbar, are you the seconder on that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Um, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Would everyone please check their votes um, to make sure that that was unanimous? Did you vote? I didn't touch it. Okay. Or... I don't know. Okay. So that motion was approved 11 to 0. Correct. Okay. Um, so with that, next item we have before us is item 13D, resolution number AR 2020-231, a resolution superseding resolution AR number 2019-200 to allow for the expanded project area of the 43rd Ave Arrow to Constellation Water Main Rehab and Intershi Project within Arrow Acres and North Shore subdivisions. Thank you. We don't have anyone signed up to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Constant and Zongzo. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Huh. Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have item 13E, resolution number AR 2020-260, a resolution adopting recommendations to be forwarded to the Anchorage Metropolitan Area Transportation Solutions AMATS Policy Committee regarding an amendment to the FFY 2019-2022 Transportation Improvement Program TIP. We don't have anyone uh, signed up to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Constant Weddleton. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Davidson. Yes. Mr. Prince Verdia. Yes. Mr. Weddleton and Mr. Dunbar. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have item 13, ordinance number EO 2020-71, an ordinance amending the zoning map and approving the rezoning of approximately 29.69 acres from CEPLI district to CERTMSL district for Tract 1 Carroll Creek subdivision. Wait, reading. Thank you. Have anyone to testify on this item? Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will support this. Obviously, the community, for the most part, I believe, does. Um, this is actually a very interesting um, evolution, so to speak, of what started off being something very scary to the community and turned out to be something a whole lot more acceptable. So that's a really good thing. Um, but I will mention that um, the only complaint I have is that um, even though the um, Eagle River, Chigak Eagle River Advisory Board does not have to give approval of this, um, they really should have been uh, part of this final decision and they were not. So I just want to uh, kind of point that out, that we need to make sure that when we have things like this going on in that area, that that advisory board is set up for a reason. And um, I know they would appreciate having more heads up about how some of these things are coming forward. Um, so anyway, I, like I said, there's really no 
uh, opposition to this from the community, but we ne definitely need to make sure that the groups out there that are really responsible for this, even in code, uh, make sure that they are uh, up to date and get the opportunity to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allen. Thank you. I just wanted to also comment that um, the community is for this um, for the most part, and I also spoke to the community councils that were involved in this area, area and they also were um, for it too, so that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have 13G, Ordinance Number ER 2020-74, and Ordinance Adopting the Spinard Corridor Plan as an element of the Comprehensive Plan. We have reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone signed up to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to postpone to September 15th. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Constant. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Weddleton? You know, I've gone through it fairly carefully and um, sent some comments to uh, Mr. Schutte and Ms. McNulty. Um, then I'd like to maybe work on it with them. So that'll give us three weeks to do that, and we might um, send it to CDC maybe that Thursday before that meeting or maybe have a work session, but give us some time to see it. Nothing critical. I think it's a good plan. It's just missing a few things. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to hear from the administration um, if you have any concerns with that kind of delay. Let the record reflect that uh, Mr. Shooty is shaking his head no. That's, that is, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I, I won't oppose the motion, but I just wanted to point out that this has been on the agenda for a while, and we've also, this has been a community effort, and the administration's been working on this for literally years, and comments could have been turned in way long ago. So I, I'm a little confused as to why they're just being brought up now, and I know the community in Spinard is really eager to get this passed. There's been strong support, and so I guess I would just ask Mr. Weddleton if it's really necessary to, I, I think we offered early on to take this to the EDC, and I don't think he took us up on that offer and now wants to do that. So I'm just a little confused as to why these comments weren't raised earlier. Is that a call to speak? Y yeah, I I'm not sure if that was a question. I'm, I'm going to assume it was Ms. Quinn Davidson. Uh, I'll go ahead, go to you, Mr. Weddleton. Um, yeah, I apologize for being late on my comments to it. Uh, it was really busy the last two months. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Too sorry. Thank you. Mr. perez -Bridia. Yeah, my comments, I guess, echo Ms. Quinn Davidson's. I, I want to respect Mr. Weddleton and his um, need to um, have more time. I just, I guess I feel like that we've really worked through this, and there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of debate and a lot of working on this. And so, um, you know, out of respect for all of the people that have been involved in it and the community council, I, I think I'm going to oppose this um, effort to extend because I think we've done the work. And so um, I would just say that even though I respect your, your need, I, I also feel like we need to respect all the pe pe people that have put all the work into it and feel like it's, it's re ready to go. So th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone. Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That motion uh, passes seven to four. So that will be back before us on uh, September 15th. Uh, um, Want to do a gut check? Are we ready for 13A? Do we have the amendments? Uh, amendment, hopefully printed. Oh, 
Right. It, it didn't, I don't think it was printed. Okay. okay. We'll keep going. As someone is doing that, right? No. Okay. I will do it right now. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so next we have item 14A, Assembly Memorandum Number AM 439-2020, Employee Relations Board Appointments. We don't have anyone signed up to testify on this item. This money is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Seeing none, we'll vote in a second. And this is a motion to accept. Oh, no, it's a motion. Yeah, that's. It's a. It's an. Yeah. Okay. I believe there's. They might still be on the phone. And it was Megan, Chris. Yes. Okay. Got. Yeah. Okay. Members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. Congratulations to the new members of that board. Next, we have item 14, <laughs> ordinance number AO 2020-87, an ordinance authorizing disposable of legal property, of real property, legally described as Lot 5, Block 72, original town site of Anchorage. Wait, reading. Thank you. There's a... Uh, Item 14G. There's no one signed up to testify. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Constant in the France. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Ms. Kennedy and Mr. Dunbar. I don't have a current item. Click over to current item. That's where it should have been. I was mad. Oh, we're pretty soon we'll forget that old system. That item is approved 11 to 0. So I said you're going to let me win and then we'll go to the ready or something. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to print the motion. It's kind <laughs> I of like know, I know. You're, I'm sorry. you're challenging me. <laughs> that happens a lot. All right. <laughs> Uh, next, we have item 15A, resolution number AR 2020-297, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly stating its conditional protest regarding a new beverage dispensary tourism liquor license number 5917 and restaurant designation permit for JL 35th Avenue Hotel LLC DBA Residence Inn by Marriott Anchorage Midtown. Wave reading. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anyone signed up to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Second. Proof. <laughs> Zalatel Constant. Um, apologies, I forgot to read my spiel here. The next items on the agenda involve applications for a liquor or marijuana license and or special land use permit for alcohol or marijuana. The process to review these items is different than the Assembly's legislative role because these are administrative or quasi-judicial hearings and require the assembly to be impartial, refrain from ex parte communications, accept liquor license applications, and make a decision based only on the record before us and testimony today. With that, is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. 
Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have 15B, resolution number AR 2020-298. Resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly regarding the first time renewal of Municipal Marijuana Cultivation License Number M12317 for Anchorage Bowl LLC DBA Anchorage Bowl, stating the Assembly's conditional protest of the renewal of State of Alaska Marijuana License Number 12317. Wait, reading. Thank you. There's no one signed up to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Not to approve. Second. Constant Zolotel. Is there any discussion on this item? Ms. Alto. Yes, I had a question, and I don't know um, if there's anyone here who can cover it, but it suggests that this applicant owes $4,108.99 in taxes, fees, and fines, but then in Section 2, it indicates that the municipal clerk has not received certification from the finance department. That appears to be inconsistent but apparently it's not. We did not get certification, but we know how much is owed. Okay, if it's consistent and that's accurate, then I wanted to make sure, but it didn't seem to be the case. But if we didn't get our certification, but we know that that much is also owed, then I'm okay. <clears throat> Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Ms. Allard. Oh, there she is. Oh, perfect. You're good. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have item 15C, resolution number ER 2020-300. Resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving a modification to a previously approved special land use permit for AK Joint, a marijuana cultivation facility with license number, license number M11920, doing business as Voodoo Cannabis Company. Wave reading. Thank you. There's no one signed up to testify. Thank you. Public testimony is closed on this item. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any, Mr. Welton. Uh, the Community and Economic Development Committee met and discussed this in detail on August 20th, and we recommend approval. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. All right. Per the artful motion uh, to change the order of the day, we're going to go back to 13A. We have the amendment before us now. Uh, one thing. I believe so, Mr. Chair. I believe so. And just so far as I think I said, I'm going to put an amendment in motion since so that. Okay, so now we're back on item 13A, and the motion we have before us is a motion to postpone. Uh, Ms. Allard on the motion to postpone? Okay. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would just urge a no vote on the motion to postpone so that we can take up this item, amend it, and then or potentially amend it, and then potentially vote on it tonight. But... Again, I think there is a time element to this, and I would like us to resolve it tonight. So please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone this item to September 15th. Mr. Peterson. No. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. Mr. needs to vote. Oh, there he is. 
that motion fails eight to three. So we have the uh, main motion before us, a motion to approve a A motion to approve was made, Mr. Chair. Oh, you're you're correct. I, I believe you're correct. I think we went straight to a motion. Point of order. Point of information, maybe. Sure, Mr. Constant. I just, for the record, we received an email from someone who suggested we didn't have a public hearing on this item. Did we have a public hearing on this item? Yes, we did. We did, and the public hearing closed. That is correct. Thank you. Mr. 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 Chair, to correct myself and say that actually I have a note that Mr. Dunbar made a motion to approve. This must have been before the motion to postpone was. And then. Um, Mr. Constance, I did that. So we do have a motion to approve that would be on the floor now. Thank you. So the clerk advises me that we do have a motion to approve on the floor. So um, thank you, Ms. Quinn-Davidson, but we don't need that motion. Um, okay. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Moved LaFrance Amendment 1. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the body for giving a little bit more time to take a look at this ordinance. Um, so this amendment seeks to add some additional language because the AO79S in front of us only has three whereas statements. And so I believe that adding some clarifying language regarding the justification for creating the Office of Equity and Justice, as well as funding and performance evaluation of the chief equity officer position is helpful in showing why this is needed. Um, it's rather long, Mr. Chair. Do you want me to read it? I will leave that up to your discretion. <laughs> okay, I'm, I would like to read it because I don't know that anyone um, else has seen it. And to be quite frank, um, this is a rough draft and there may be some factual errors in it and punctuation, etc. So, whereas inequities create barriers to educational success, economic opportunity and wellness and undermine the collective prosperity of residents in the municipality of Anchorage, and whereas skin color disability and LGBT LGBTQIA plus status is a major predictor of life experiences including economic and health outcomes and whereas there are race-based disparities in tobacco use, chronic disease such as cancer, diabetes, and COPD, alcohol-induced deaths, suicide, poverty, educational attainment, and access, household wealth, life expectancy, environmental quality, and exposure to environmental harm such as pollution, bankruptcy rates, and insurance coverage, and whereas, according to the Brookings Institute, nationally, COVID-19 is already the third leading cause of death for black Americans in 2020. And whereas Alaska's suicide rate has been about twice the national average for years, with the suicide rate among Alaska Native people twice that of the Alaska average, and four times as high as the U.S. average, and nationally and statewide, has been increasing in recent years among older adults, young adults, and youth, and the suicide rate is a classic sociological indicator of overall social health or dysfunction. And whereas the 2019 financial empowerment blueprint showed that racial minority groups in Anchorage have higher poverty and unemployment rates, and whereas in a single year, over half of the homeless youth served by Covenant House were Alaska Native, despite being only 12% of the municipality's population, and Covenant House reported 27 that over one in four youth served in one year were survivors of human trafficking and the largest risk factors for the Office of Child Services OCS involvement in Anchorage are one, the mother's experience with homelessness and two, poverty making their family's involvement with OCS over five times more likely and the second highest risk factors were the mother's age and education attainment and if the mother did not finish high school involvement with OCS is four times more likely and whereas many government policies and practices have historically been designed to react to problems and crises in our communities after they arise. And by examining the root causes of these problems and crises, we can create solutions that ultimately prevent the conditions that led to the crises and problems from occurring. And whereas in an effort to address long-standing equity issues that negatively impact organizations and communities, 
Many corporations and governments in the U.S. are creating diversity and equity officer positions, which are showing to be most effective in making positive changes when granted authority within the organization. And whereas the Municipality of Anchorage Office of Equity and Justice has been structured similar to the Office of Internal Audit, with appointees approved by the Assembly and reporting directly to the Mayor, and whereas making a shift from costly, crisis-oriented responses to health and social problems to an investment approach that directs resources where most needed and focuses on prevention and recovery can potentially reduce costs to ta taxpayers, and whereas collecting and analyzing data, establishing benchmarks, collaborating with nonprofits, churches, and community partners requires staffing resources that do not exist within the municipality and can be provided at a yearly cost of 0.01 mil, or $3.50 to the average taxpayer. And whereas it is the intention of the Assembly that the administration seek 50% matching funds through grants and foundations to leverage taxpayer dollars for the chief equity officer position and provide performance measures within three months of appointment for annual evaluation by the Assembly. So this uh, amendment seeks to create a context of um, you know, identifying that what we want to do is raise the collective prosperity for everyone in the municipality through a, you know, targeted investment approach that's not just reactionary, but that seeks to put the resources where needed most. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank uh, Ms. LaFrance for her diligent work on this amendment. This is really remarkable and lays out a lot of the disparities that we all sort of know or encounter every once in a while, but seldom do you see them all laid out like this, or, or many of them laid out like this. Um, because this is a, uh, an administrative, uh, an ordinance that originated with the administration, I'd like to hear their thoughts on this amendment. And I'd also like, in particular, I'd like them to comment on the last whereas about seeking 50% matching funds. Um, perhaps that came up in the work session and I just forgot about it, but is that your intent and can that be done? Uh, through the chair, Assemblymember Dunbar, um, we certainly uh, appreciate all the work that went into this. I think it does lay out a lot of the, the issues that we've we've discussed. So we're supportive of, of um, the the amendment, uh, specifically on the the last whereas clause. Um, we can certainly uh, attempt um, to. Uh, try to find uh, matching funds. The only position that I could come up with off the top of my head that we have um, had a foundation help pay uh, for over the last couple of years is Robin Ward's uh, position as the, the real estate director. So we can certainly um, ask if, if other foundations are willing to, to help us out on this position. The, the grants uh, might be a little bit of a tougher um uh, opportunity, but we can certainly look to see if there are grants available for positions like this. Typically, when we have grant-funded positions, there um, there are quite a few within the health department. Um, I know the uh, through some burn grants uh, through the Department of Justice, we we do fund some police officers and, and things like that. But um, I, I just don't know if there are grants that are specific to a position like this. But we will certainly look for for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Allen. My question is, can, it's LGBTQ. Can somebody tell me what IA stands for, please? It's on the second whereas. Mr. Chair, may I defer to someone who knows? Can thank I ask Mr. Constance? Yeah, thank you. So it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and A can be allies or, uh, say again? Asexual. Asexual. Yeah, people who just don't have any of that. So. <laughs> LGBT, bisexual, transgender. It doesn't matter. It's That's a de minimis issue. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to say, I think a lot of what Mr. Dunbar said, I just appreciate Ms. LaFrance so eloquently laying all this out, and I think it really adds a lot. Um, I had two specific questions. One is in the second to last, whereas, are, is Ms. LaFrance suggesting that 
it would cost each individual or property owner, rather, $3.50 a year to pay for this position because I just can't imagine that the, the math adds up on that one. And then the second um, was about the grants. And I guess I'm trying to understand when we say it is the intention that the admins seek, uh, I guess they're just required to look for them. And I want to make sure that's the intent and that that's what our lawyers think it means. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Quinn Davidson, for those questions. I think the first question was, is the math correct? And um, that's based on a dollar per $100,000 worth of property. And I believe the average is about a $350,000 home. I guess I should have said residential, maybe. Um, and perhaps someone from the administration could uh, correct if, if that's not accurate. And I couldn't quite hear the second part, but I think you asked, is, um, is it a, a requirement to seek out um, additional funds? Is, it, is that correct through the chair, Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yeah, I think the first question can go to the administration, to Alex or Lance or whoever's there that can answer that. And then the second one, it might be best to just have Dean or Kate answer it. I want to make sure that that states, you know, that our intent is that people, that they try. But we're not going to cut the office if they don't meet that threshold. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, if Mr. Gates would address um, the language of the last paragraph, the last whereas, and um, I know you didn't write it, but um, if you could comment on any kind of like implications as Ms. Quinn Davidson asked or Ms. Vogel. Um, through the chair, uh, Mr. Gates pointed at me, so I'll take it. Um, uh, I certainly read this as um, a statement of uh, intention that the administration seek it, but that it does, it's in a whereas clause and it does not in any way invalidate or defund the position uh, should the funds not be there or even frankly if the administration uh, in some future year would fail to seek it. Um, that since it's not part of the um, language of the ordinance itself, it wouldn't result in a defunding. So it, it is an expression of the intention of the level of funding support that the assembly um, is hoping to bring and, the, and, and an expression of intention regarding where other funds might come from. But existing as it does in the whereas clause, it shouldn't... Um, harm the ability of the office to continue to exist uh, regardless of whether that portion is satisfied in any particular year. Thank you. And then on the second question regarding the math, is there someone who can answer that one? Uh, through the chair, Assembly Member Quinn Davidson, when you kind of put in the the dollar amount for this position into kind of the large Excel kind of calculator does spit out a 0 0.01 mil. I think that to get the the exact dollar amount on what the the average would, I would have to go back and ask either OMB or our, our, our finance folks uh, tonight because that does seem uh, a little high um, uh, to me uh, based on the 0 0.01 mil. So uh, if we need the exact amount, I would have to um, uh, phone a friend to somebody in uh, uh, OMB or finance, and I don't think any of them are on the line at, at this point in the night. Can I speak to that, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Yeah, I recall, Mr. Brockham said, you and I were recently talking about something, and I can't remember what it was, but it was a big number that it would cost the municipality, and I asked you to do some math on what it would cost the average homeowner, and it was something like 80 cents. So I think the math is wrong, and without checking it, I'd like to take that out. If you're sure that the 0.01 mil is correct, could we just leave that in there? So I guess I'm moving to remove three. the, let's see. I think I'm just uh, moving to remove 
or three fifty to the average taxpayer. Second. Seconded by Mr. Constant. Did you want to speak to that further? No. I I'm just concerned it's wrong. So I'd rather take it out. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and go down the queue for this amendment to the amendment. Mr. Weddleton, did you want to speak to it? Don't have to. Um, not to that amendment. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Bachenstead, did you want to speak to that amendment to the amendment? Ms. Kennedy, did you want to speak to the amendment to the amendment? Ms. LaFrance on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can't we just bracket that and do like we do with Scribner's errors or we give like whoever is inputting this uh, the leeway to correct it so that there's time. Um, I mean, it's late and I can't really think on my feet right now, but I think that's helpful reference to people. If that's allowable, I would amend my motion to do that, Mr. Chair. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the clerk advises me that we don't actually need a motion to do that, but I want to get... Uh, Want to make sure we're good by Mr. Gates. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, if it's clearly indicated here in the documents and yeah, your intentions are stated clearly, I think you can do that. Insert the accurate number on either one. Okay, so with that, uh, do the mover and seconder agree to withdraw the motion? Yes. Mr. Constant. For my part, never trust my math, but I spitballed uh, 0 0.01 mils, so that's 0 0.0001 times the average home value 350 is actually $3.50. And so uh, I look forward to getting the actual number, but I believe Ms. LaFrance may in fact be right. Thank you. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and leave that to a scrivener's um, correction at some point in the future when that math is double checked. Okay, so now we're back to the amendment. I'll go back in the queue, Mr. Weddleton. Okay, the question that I actually have two small amendments I'd like to offer. Um, one is, what is the 2019 financial empowerment blueprint? I guess that's to me. Um, <laughs> For the record, it is after 11.30. Um, thank you, Mr. Weddleton, through the chair for that question. I received, I'm gonna have to take a minute and pull up my computer because I received information from an Andrew, or Agnew Brett presentation that notated that um, document. So I will get that. Can I offer an amendment in the meantime? And we'll sure. Let's not waste time. You know, multitask, Ms. LaFrance? Sure. Okay, on the uh, last final whereas, I'd like to add some wording so that it will read, whereas it is the intention of the assembly that the administration seek 50% matching fund through grants and foundations to leverage taxpayer dollars uh, for the chief equity officer position, new wording, and when the tax is in place to use alcohol tax funds for 50%, and the rest would stay the same. Second. Moved and seconded. Did you want to speak to that? You know, I would speak to that. And one is, the, you know, uh, one that, that much of our discussion on what to do with the alcohol tax is focused on the theory of change, which has made equity a prime component of that so let's um plug this in right here and now and um do part of what we've been talking about and it also knocks that 3.5 down to a buck 75 a year for the average home thank you uh so going back through the queue again on this new amendment to the amendment mr buckstead miss kennedy I'm not sure where I'm at on this either. Um, actually, can I say, I'll save my question for after the amendment. Thank you. Sure. That's one. Ms. Zolotel. Thank you. Mr. Wellington, what's, do you have a written out? Can I just look at your paper quick? I want to see what your punctuation is, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I 
Is it before or after the comma? I'll say it's here. I don't really kind of would like to say one, two, three. Okay. So, so I think Mr. Weddleton's punctuation is good because it all goes before the comma after chief equity officer position and his language and the comma because I think that's important because what it does is it makes it our intention to do that and make that a possibility but it doesn't constrain or require it particularly of a future assembly um, and we have still to um, debate and land where the final alcohol tax will be. So if that is in fact the case, then I support Mr. Waddleton's amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you. My comments are very similar to Ms. Zolotel, so I don't have the language in front of me. Uh, I don't know if we can get that up before we vote on it, but this needs to be um, an intent but not a requirement, if that makes sense. Um, because who knows what might happen with the alcohol tax itself uh, or with um, what we decide is an appropriate expense with the alcohol tax. There's, there's a lot of future possibilities. So while I perhaps agree with the idea that the alcohol, portion of the alcohol tax should be used, I don't think it should be a predicate for um, this to be funded. So I think that's important to put on the record. Thank you. Can I address? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Can I address that? Uh, sure. Right, it just, well, the, where it says it is the intention that would flow through, I think. But I do really intend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Quinn Davidson? Oh, I was just going to say that, thank you, Mr. Chair, that I agree with Mr. Whittleson. Good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant? So I, I don't disagree. I support it. However, I'm seeing this trend in some of the work that we're doing that we're looking to fund half. And I know this is an intent statement. And so it's not, it doesn't leave a project half unfunded. But I just come back to the thought of a half measure avails us nothing. And so we just have to guard against this idea of trying to do something, but then doing it halfway and then letting it die on the vine because we didn't do it all the way. So I know that isn't what happens here, but I just throw that caution into the conversation. Thank you. Uh, with that, Mr. Weddleton, can you repeat the amendment one more time? Sure. Uh, whereas it is the intention of the Assembly that the administration seek 50% matching funds through grants and foundations to leverage taxpayer dollars for the chief equity officer position, comma, new wording, and when the tax is in place to use alcohol tax funds for 50%. And then uh, just continue with the existing wording. Hmm. Okay. Does that work? Check my grammar. Oh, it's up here. Oh, delete the comma after position, I'm told. Okay. It's in the wrong position. Forty. Do you get that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just, just I'm still working on it too. All right. Um, with that, seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment to the amendment. I just described it and when the tax is in place. And I guess we'll get that. Could you repeat that, Mr. Weddleton? Uh, it's, it would be, and when the tax is in place to use the alcohol tax, or I'm sorry, you could just say after what you have, and when the tax is in place to use alcohol tax for 50%. Okay. Mr. Peterson. Ms. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Yeah. 
that amendment to the amendment passes 11 to 0. Now, uh, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to the question, what is the 2019 financial empowerment blueprint? Um, a little bit of background. In 2018, Anchorage was selected as one of 10 cities to receive a city start, start grant from the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund to facilitate coordination, support, and growth of financial empowerment services in the municipality. Um, financial empowerment fund finds financial empowerment as four key components, asset building, banking access, consumer financial protection, financial education and counseling. The broad this broad definition guides the development of Anchorage's financial empowerment blueprint. And um, that was the 2019 version that showed that racial minority groups in Anchorage have higher poverty and unemployment rates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go back in the queue for the amendment. Mr. Bottenstead? Yes, I just uh, uh, got a couple of additional uh, positions uh, in the municipality that we have uh, funded uh, uh, through grants. Um, uh, the biggest one is probably the I-Team uh, that had been funded for a number of years through a Bloomberg grant. Uh, I believe um, quite a bit of uh, that grant has now gone away and we are funding it um, through municipal dollars because of the amount of work that they bring in. And then another one for a couple of years was actually Nancy Burke's position was funded through the Mental Health Trust as well. So those are just a couple of additional uh, positions that have been funded through either foundations or grants that we have received. So just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you. And not on the amendment, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. oh okay. When I get to the main motion, got it. Apologies. Um, seeing no uh, further discussion on the amendment, members may proceed to vote on the France Amendment Number 1. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That amendment passes 11 to 0. We're now back to the main motion. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, uh, make sure I've got all my things here that I was looking at. Um, my concern in this position uh, was, well, first of all, what would this person really be doing and why couldn't we use the resources and the services that we already have and when I look at the list of what we expect this person to do, I think this person already needs four or five assistants. Um, so anyway, I, I guess part of my concern about this was that I know our um, Equal Opportunity Office uh, has uh, kind of experienced a backlog of about 22% of their cases are over 240 days old. Um, so my concern was always that office needed more help, and I was hoping that maybe hiring two people instead of one uh, could probably meet some of that need and address some of this. So I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I don't know if you, um, Mr. Bakken said, maybe have a comment on that. Um, but I guess I'm still kind of wondering uh, what the role will be between this person and the Office of Equal Opportunity and what kind of assistance this person might have with some of the challenges, obviously, the complaints or issues that um, this office already has a little bit of issue addressing. Uh, will there be any? It does say they'll work together. Um, is there any hope that they will actually be able to help, or is this person going to be so overwhelmed with this new charge that they really will just um, actually need more help themselves. Thank you. Um, through the chair, Assembly Member uh, Kennedy, I, I mean, I think this is uh, going to be one of the things that uh, the, once the person is, is brought on, as both laid out within the, the actual ordinance and in this amendment, um, to come up with kind of what are the, the main kind of uh, points that we want to address um, immediately, either through uh, uh, gathering additional metrics to help guide 
uh, the position as well as coming up is within this uh, particular uh, amendment, uh, coming up with particular um, performance measures so that uh, we're actually accomplishing, I think, the goals that are laid out within this ordinance. So the hope is certainly that um, once this person is brought on, all of those things um, will, will be uh, really looked at. And, and, and I, I, I don't believe that additional um, uh, people at this time are going to be necessary to do the, the work that we're wanting them to do immediately. Can I just follow up a little bit? So, and then kind of the other part of that question is how how connected is this person going to be with the Equal Opportunity Office, and is there potential for helping with some of the backlog of 240 days or more? I, I think the hope is is certainly that they they work very closely together. Um, I, I don't think sitting here tonight that I can absolutely promise that on day one this individual is going to be. Uh, helping uh, reduce some of the other backlogs, but certainly uh, the intent is that um, this position work very closely with the uh, OEL, they work very closely with the Ombudsman, they work very closely with you know our Equal Rights Commission um, that all kind of uh, handle uh, similarly situated issues, but um, I, I can't sit here and guarantee you that on day one they're going to be able to help with that. Thank you. Ms. Alley? Thank you. I have a, a two questions, um, one for you, Chair. Possibly you can answer it, and then one for the administration. Okay. The first one is, so when we're doing all these amendments and the public has already testified, and then it completely changes the, um, in my opinion, the AO, the public can't come back and testify again, correct? Uh, that is correct. We have not reopened uh, public testimony. Would we be able to reopen public testimony after all the amendments are submitted? Uh, that is a motion that any member could make. When would I make that motion? If you wanted to make it now, you could. All right. I'd like to make a motion that we open up public testimony um, after all the amendments are completed. So I think just to clarify, you'd like to set uh, this item, reopen and set it for public testimony to for a future meeting? Is that Correct. Right? And what would that meeting be? When would we that could do it the next one, the 15th of September, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Kennedy. Did you want to speak to that further? Yeah, I think it's fair. I'm getting inundated by emails and people are concerned that all these changes and they didn't get to the voice their opinions on it. Um, so I would just recommend that we be open and transparent like we promised the public in the future. And then if we can re allow the public to come back in and, and um, voice their opinions and thoughts on this, I think that would be appropriate. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick comment. We actually haven't changed any of the substance of the AO, only the whereas statements. So I don't believe there has been significant or substantial change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That uh, motion fails eight to three. Uh, we now are back to the main motion. No, miss out. Yeah, I just had one question to the administration. Um, do you have, by any chance, the the um, like the numbers of how not the issues or concerns, but how many um, we are backlogged as far as uh, complaints? Uh, through the chair, Assembly Member Allard, I don't have that on me. Uh, as we're sitting here right now, I would have to uh, track that number down. Can I get that uh, one available, please? Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. And this is on the main motion. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. 
Mr. Perez for Dia. Mr. Perez for Dia. Absolutely, I guess. Um, let's just give it a second. Let me... Sorry, yes, my, I vote yes. <laughs> that item passes 10 to 1. All right, so just want to lay out tomorrow's meeting. Um, so when I'm done, I'm going to ask for a motion to continue this meeting to 5 p.m. tomorrow. And uh, we'll start with items 15D, E, and F. Then after that, we will come back to items 13C, 13H, I, and J, 14B, C, D, E, and F. So that will be our meeting tomorrow. With that, can I get a motion to continue to tomorrow at 5 p.m.? Move to continue. Point of order. Did you get 15B in your list of... That was that last buzz we, of the initial. We completed 15B. We did B? We did No, there was a person to testify on that one. On 15D, uh, no, I don't have someone to testify on 15D, but we did not complete it. So that was on my list. D, no. E, and F. That was on your list to do next tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ms. Allard, did you want to speak on this motion? Uh, I just want, before, are we going to vote next, correct? Yes. So the, before we voted, I just wanted to um, say that I'm going to probably vote no to proceed for tomorrow because I still believe that the public needs to be in here and be in face-to-face -face testimony. So thank you. Thank you. With that, members may uh, proceed to vote on the motion to continue. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That passes 10 to 1. With that, we'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. <laughs>